Hey kids, you're listening to the internet's wettest podcast about video games, consoles, and pancakes. The SML Podcast. What's up, everybody? This is the SML Podcast. I am your host, Joe. Joining as usual, Cole, how are you doing? I'm alive. You are. It's uh, it's the post-700 hangover. Yeah. Now there's nothing cool to talk about. Oh, We're you're full like, of shit. There's plenty of cool oh, stuff to talk about. We have an interview we today. <gasps> we're not alone. No, we're not alone. We're faking that we're alone right now? Go figure. When do we ever wow. do that for every <laughs> interview ever? Dan Airy of Rainbite, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are how are all of you? Yeah, well, doing. You know, we're here. We're just yeah. <laughs> going through the motions. <laughs> this, this is episode seven hundred and seven hundred and first episode. Yeah, I wasn't sure if this was going to be seven hundred one or seven hundred two because we don't plan that well. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> huh. so we're just kind of like flying by the seat of our pants. 700 and episodes and uh, so bunch of kids. <laughs> <laughs> 700 episodes and zero experience. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so you were oh, here from <laughs> you were here from Rainbite. You just released the game Trigger Witch. Uh for the people who don't know what this game is, give us the sales pitch. Tell us what is Trigger Witch. So Trigger Witch is a kind of Zelda style um action hey, adventure kids. game. Uh, except the gameplay is a twin stick shooter. And it's set in kind of like a fantasy world, um, you know, based around this coven of witches, except they've discovered firearms. Um, <laughs> and that's all part of the story. But they've decided that magic is, you know, that that's, you know, what grandma does. And so they're going to stick with, um, you know, they're going to stick with firearms. Uh, and, you know, it all ties into the story. But that's the, you know, that's the core concept. And and then off you go. There's there's a villain, of course. Um and yeah, big world to explore, and yeah, good fun story. And it is bloody. I <laughs> the first time I shot an enemy and it exploded into giblets, I just smiled with glee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just yeah, went yeah, out we of really my way to turn overboard. on confetti mode and was just like, I just want to be happy the whole time. <laughs> as soon as I saw confetti mode, I was like, button pressed. Yeah, my wife likes confetti mode as well, and we've we've had I think it's probably about fifty fifty people switching between. So we're really happy that we added that option. Oh, that's cool. I'm surprised to hear that so many people would go for the pinata mode and get the confetti instead of the the blood and giblets. Do you are are there actual like statistics that you have that show what people are doing in game? Uh, we don't actually have those statistics, uh, but we just heard from quite a few people, you know, seeing um, gameplay videos, you know, on YouTube reviews, probably about 30% are done in uh, confetti mode. And definitely we've had some uh, thankful messages from, you know, parents of younger kids who, you know, they really <laughs> like the look of the game and they want to they want to get it. But, uh, you know, the condition is, hey, kids, you know, pinata mode only. <laughs> or you can have people like our reviewer, Tim who just played it with his kid on normal mode and didn't realize there was a pinata mode until way too late. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that kid's okay. <laughs> well, see, I was, I was playing it with confetti mode on and my youngest was watching and she was like, this is so fun. And I'm like, uh huh. <laughs> and then I didn't ever tell her that there was an option for it to be blood and gore instead. I was just like, yep, that's confetti. <laughs> that's all it is. You shoot them with the gun. She, why do you shoot them with the gun and then just make them blow? I don't know. <laughs> that's just what they did. And it's confetti. <laughs> And isn't that great? Yeah. She's like, you should have had to hit him with a stick. I was like, sure, should have hit him with a stick. <laughs> oh, that's good, yeah. Eight what she doesn't know can't hurt her. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, hit, you hit Pinatas with a stick. You don't shoot him with a gun. Uh-huh, sure. She's wild beyond her ears. Wild beyond her ears, <laughs> too. But, you know. That leads to a, a good first question. Why guns? Yeah. Well, people like guns, um, especially in games. And... I suppose it's just that. kind of like a 
<laughs> yeah, but maybe a convention, I suppose, in games where, you know, it's just such a fundamental part of so many combat systems. And, and when you're combining it with the gameplay of twin stick shooters, like I can, I, off the top of my head, I can hardly think of any, uh, twin stick shooters where you're playing without guns almost. Um, and yeah, we kind of thought up, you know, the whole kind of concept, uh, of the storyline, you know, or, or rather, rather tied it all in so that it worked. It worked well with, it worked well with guns. And the other thing with guns is that you get the option to do a lot of different, um, you know, types of weapons, you know, flamethrowers, grenade launches. <laughs> so you get like variable gameplay just with that one concept. So did the concept come first or did the story come first? I think the story came first, actually. Um, probably two and a half, maybe three years ago, we were finishing up work on another game and we have like a big, uh, Google Word document that we all just throw ideas into just whenever we think of them. And I think this this one started as a horizontal shooter, like, you know, like an arcade shoot 'em up. And um, sadly, the other guys in the team don't really like that genre of game. That's kind of more <laughs> my passion. <laughs> um, I would absolutely so, have played this as a schmuck, too. Yeah, well, the, the, the original story was that it was going to be in, like, an amusement park, and you're riding your broomstick and firing <gasps> firing guns. <laughs> and in each level is kind of, you know, you've got the haunted house one and all that sort of thing. Um, and it's actually quite funny to look back at the document and I can, you can see the history of me writing it down. You know, I'll come back a week later and I'll change a little bit of it. And it was going to be called, uh, Glock Witches. Glock Witch. <laughs> yeah. But Glock is copyright. Yeah. Really? So I think it's a trade. Yeah. I think it I is. Know that. I believe so. Mm-hmm. It's a specific yeah. type of pistol. Ah, oh, so it's like the Kleenex or the Q-tip or Jello yeah. of guns, basically. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, most definitely. So that that had to change as well. And we, our our, our first game that we made, Reverie, is a uh, very sort of traditional Zelda-like, um, except it's set in modern day New Zealand. And so we already had a few systems that worked well. We kind of knew the work pipeline to make that that sort of game, you know, with the overworld and the dungeons. So we really wanted to step that up and you know, see how far we can take that concept, but then really switch up the gameplay because a lot of people, uh, some of the main criticisms of Reverie was that the combat was quite simplistic. So almost like the um, original Legend of Zelda or Link to the Past, you know, you just push the button to swing your sword. And nothing's so, wrong with that in my yes, eyes. Nothing was wrong with that, but <laughs> we just thought, how, how far can we take this? <laughs> and you took it far. <laughs> Uh, speaking of Reverie, our one of our other team members, Chris Taylor, is a huge fan of the game. And since you brought it up, I got to know, are there any plans to ever bring that to Xbox? We've talked about it. And now that we have the uh, dev kits, because we yeah, we decided this time around we would release Trigger Witch on all three console platforms on the same day. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, because Reverie was a very staggered release. It was a Vita exclusive originally, and then it came out a couple of months later on PS4 and then Switch and different regions. It was all over the place. You know, one week it's Europe, one week it's um, America. And yeah, so we decided just everywhere, all platforms on the same day. Um, and so we're looking at, we are seriously looking at bringing Reverie over to Xbox. Uh, once once porting work on Trigger Witch is done, we're kind of looking at Steam and Mac. Um, you know, just while it's hot and while it's fresh, we're wanting to get as many people into Trigger Witch as possible. That makes sense. But yeah, absolutely. On, it's on the cards. Mm. That is very good to hear. Yeah, uh, I'm thrilled that this came to all platforms at the same time. Uh, what are the challenges in doing a multi-platform release as opposed to doing one platform at a time? The challenges are many. <laughs> There's a lot. Yeah, so, you know, it's well, you've got to get registered with all the platforms. Initially, you've got to get hardware as well for all the platforms and as you are changing you know they all work slightly differently with their save systems with um, user accounts on playstation and xbox of course you've got trophies and achievements which work slightly differently as well Um, so it's just really uh, you know you might change something on playstation and then xbox doesn't like it or (laughs) you know the switch struggles with it and yeah all that all that sort of thing so it's just really I think you've got to be quite disciplined in terms of the additions and modifications you're making and really think about what the repercussions will be um, for other platforms. Uh, and, and that goes for um, performance as well. So so I think with Switch is 
you know, being a handheld console or half a handheld console, you know, that has uh, greater, you know, battery limitations, performance limitations compared to the home consoles. So it's just, yeah, really making sure that everything, you know, something might run absolutely perfectly on the home consoles, but you have to just adjust it a little bit. It'll be really, um, you know, disciplined in terms of how efficient how efficient you are with when it comes to switch and that was definitely the case with uh, the playstation vita for our first game as well but, you know even more so i miss the vita i really do i love that system oh, don't we all don't we all it's such <laughs> well, a great sony system. doesn't <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they're the only people that don't ironically microsoft probably misses the vita more um <laughs> yeah yeah that's a great that's a great console and it it didn't make at the time any financial sense whatsoever to release our first game on the Vita, but we just, you know, all, all three of us at the time, we really liked the Vita so much. And we, when, whenever we'd hang out um, at university, which is where we met, we would, you know, play PlayStation Vita and talk about what new Vita games are coming out. There wasn't much to talk about in that regard. Not much was coming out, but <laughs> um, yeah, those were some short conversations. But <laughs> yeah, it's such a great, such a great console. And yeah, we're really happy that we released on that first. What were the the different challenges that you ran into bringing something from the Vita to a console? Well, one is, I suppose, the screen uh, the screen size. So, you know, like your monitors and your televisions are generally sixteen by nine. Some people get into you know really extreme with the super wide screen, you know, <laughs> triple monitors, and all this. But um, the PlayStation Vita is actually not quite sixteen by nine. It's it's a few pixels different on the vertical and so um, it's like 16 by eight and a half or something yeah it's like very close or even 8.8.8 but with a game like reverie or indeed trigger which the, the the width and height of the screen really matters when you're looking at a room because the camera can't scroll beyond that point until you shift into the next room you know much like any other zelda i suppose um and so yeah bringing that over to playstation and uh, PlayStation 4 rather and Switch. Yeah, we kind of had to just slightly adjust some of the logic. And uh, on PlayStation 4, if you look really closely on each side of the screen, there's actually like two pixels of black just to just to block it off <laughs> uh, to make sure that you're not seeing anything that you don't want to. But it's not too noticeable. I never noticed that. I'll have to. I didn't notice it at all. Well, that's that's job well done then. <laughs> <laughs> GG. <laughs> uh, question from chat. M317 asks, uh, what console is the easiest to program or code for? If you oh, can answer a, something like that. <laughs> yeah, I think for us, we we found the Switch quite good. The Switch is quite forgiving. Um, and I suppose it's not just in terms of you know, programming, but it's also the the whole release pipeline. Like, how easy is it to test on the development kit and everything? And the Switch seems seems to be you know quite good for that. Um, the Xbox we went that was the last port that we did for Trigger Witch, and that was a bit more. We we just weren't used to to their flow. Um, I, w- I won't say it's a negative because I can actually see how for some for people set up for it, it would be uh, really useful. Or for big teams. For really large teams, the Xbox is great. But for a smaller team, uh, we found the Switch really good, and uh, the PlayStation Vita, ironically, is is really was really good. Um, and that's why you saw a lot of a lot of indies come out on the on the Vita, uh, despite it being you know a, a smaller install base and, and less popular. You could port it fast, and yeah, there would be no issues. The Vita was really home to a lot of good indies and RPGs, and it, it seems like the Switch has taken that mantle and run with it. Well, yeah, every, every week, you know, you look at the upcoming releases for Switch, and it's, there's just so many. It's huge oh numbers. Oh, my God. Um, I, I, get, so. I get emails from Nintendo. It's like, new releases this week, and it's just a like a page and a half of game titles. I'm like, yeah. oh, my Lord. My kids yeah, it's, it's an essay. My kids the, the essays of new releases. The <laughs> switch news on the homepage. I don't know who told number three that it's there, but somebody did. <laughs> and now she reads it and then she'll be like, all these games are coming out. And I'm like, please stop. Please don't <laughs> click that button. <laughs> well, we it's good to have kids Xbox. reading books, isn't it? So. <laughs> yeah. I, was like, I know that I encourage you to read, but this is not the reading material <laughs> I want for you. We're too poor for this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. By comparison to to Vita, 
uh, I think one of the advantages that we liked releasing on Vita was that the, the week that we the, the week that we came out with Reverie, no one else was releasing, or I think it was one other game, uh, which was Neurovoider. I still remember. <laughs> um, but th- that's one of the challenges in the modern kind of indie environment is it's not just making a good game, but you have to people have to know about your game. Um, yeah. Like you know, discovery on the digital stores is you know getting more challenging. And it's even way more challenging than it was just two or three years ago. Uh, so that's something that we focused on more as well as your know, marketing, get the word out there, trailers, screenshots. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a challenging environment, but at the same time, it's good that, you know, it's almost freer in a way. Like a lot of people, there's people who are making games nowadays that wouldn't have been able to make them five or, um, seven or eight years ago. Uh, so it's, it's pros and cons. Uh, you self published for Reverie, correct? Yes, in um, North America and Europe, uh, and, and Australia and New Zealand. Now you're working with East Asia Soft on Trigger Witch. Uh, how how is it working with a publisher instead of publishing on your own? So yeah, East Asia Soft. We worked with them on Reverie, and they published in Japan and Asia, uh, as well as they handled the physical editions. And that was a really good experience for us. They're really great to work with. Um, yeah, they just have a very yeah they release a lot of games, right? As a publisher, they release a lot of games and so they can really give some good advice and they know what works and what doesn't work compared to us who, you know, we might release a game every like two years or a year. And so we just have so much less data to work with. Um, And they, yeah, they did, they they made a huge effort for Trigger Witch for us. And yeah, we're really thankful to them and it was great working with them. Um, They handled, you know, localizations and, um, you know, just all sorts of marketing and and all that so we could just a a lot of the time we could just focus on the game and we we basically did we didn't have to worry about too much publishing stuff at least not until the end um of development yeah we just it it was great to be free to just focus on um you know focus on trigger witch rather than um having to spend 30 percent of your time on trigger witch paperwork Yeah. yeah What kind of crazy paperwork do you have to do anyway? I, I figure there's rating stuff, there's company stuff, finances, what else? <laughs> what eats up your time? Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so there's um, there's kind of the approval processes for each of the three platforms that, you know, to initially get accepted. Um, and with PlayStation, you need to have a, a static IP. So you've got to call your ISP get on a, a static IP plan so that they don't change your IP address. Um, so that's, you know, even that is, is a bit more than, is quite a bit more than Steam requires. I think Steam is quite, by comparison, quite quite easy. Um, yeah, it's just age ratings, which aren't too bad. I remember when we released um, Reverie, the European rating system was quite, was quite a lot of admin. We had to, you know, send through half an hour of unedited gameplay answer all these questions you know it was really it was quite expensive actually as well um uh, that's it's slowly becoming more streamlined the age rating systems over time um so that's really nice and yes yeah, it's, it's just filling out all of those you know like reverie was in seven languages but for the store descriptions especially in europe you have to you have to fill it out in in 21 languages like you know finnish turkish danish you oh, know, the game isn't in those languages but i think legally it has to you know it has to be on the store with descriptions in those languages and so that you know we i think we just went to twitter and just put put out a list of languages and said anyone who can translate <laughs> do some <laughs> translations gets a free copy of the game <laughs> but um yeah, yeah, time around, you know, just like that. yeah exactly exactly and i know the japanese rating system is that that's a, that's a lot more effort and we've never had to handle that um but yeah that's definitely a lot more admin since we're talking about rating systems um Given that Trigger Witch does have the the extreme gore mode and the confetti mode, does that affect the type of rating that you're eligible for? If you have like some kind of switch that you can toggle to make it more kid friendly, so we actually you, you actually don't get any advantages from that, um, mm-hmm. which is yeah a little bit unfortunate. But it's because um, the platforms can't guarantee um, that you know, a kid won't go into the menu and just turn off pinata mode. No. Ah. Because the default state of the game is the gore mode, you know, with all the blood. Yeah. And um, 
So as a result of that, yeah, you know, for instance, if you search up, you know, Trigger Witch trailer, we're on the PlayStation YouTube channel, you know, a couple of trailers, but we're not on the Nintendo one. And that's because the default state of the game, you know, Nintendo doesn't really publish trailers with that kind of content uh-huh. um, on the YouTube channel. And it would be kind of dishonest to publish a trailer with the pinata mode because then, you know, uh, parents might watch it and say, hey, this looks great for the kids. And then they, they buy it and boot it up. And the default mode is just all this blood and gore. So it would be a little bit of a misrepresentation. Um, yeah, it would so be it's, nice it's, if they could do that, though. Now that I'm thinking about it, like Microsoft uh, family accounts have a lot of, of options as far as like, I've got it set to where when number three plays uh, Knockout City, she can't even see people's usernames. It just says player. Because people put shitty things in their usernames. True. So it would be nice yeah. if there was a switch, just like toggle for toggle. Like if for it detects off. a child account, yeah. then it automatically turns pinata mode on. That I, is that even been. something technically possible? Probably not. I, th- I think it is is possible. What you mentioned with the multiplayer usernames certainly is. I think um, you know platform holders and age rating, uh, you know, ratings agencies have gotten a lot more. Yeah, aware over time of you know, people talking to others online, maybe kids mm-hmm. talking to adults in multiplayer rooms. And so there are, there's a, a wide range of options for multiplayer modes. But um, yeah, Trigger, which obviously is kind of just a local game. Um, so we don't really get access to a lot of those, a lot of those tools, which are built specifically for online play. Um, but I think it, it might be possible, at least it, it should be on, uh, on PlayStation, but you know, we didn't really have too many issues with PlayStation. They were very happy to publish the trailer because they have, a, I guess, their audience is a older audience in general. Makes sense. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, speaking of the ratings, was there any pushback from the ESRB giving it a T rating, or was there was it like borderline M rating? Um, so one thing about yeah ratings agencies is that they they really look at the the full context. You know what context is there's violence in. And it's very much in the case of Trigger Witch, quite tongue in cheek. And, you know, it's, it's pixel art. It's not realistic. You know, it's, it's nothing compared to say Mortal Kombat X fatalities or something like that. True. Um, could it have so been? Think, <laughs> 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 it could have been. Hey. <laughs> yeah. The, the M rating, the, the uncensored version is coming soon. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's, it's pixel art. It's a cute, colorful world. And, you know, it's quite, it's just a bit ridiculous, I suppose. So it, I think, you know, most people would look at a game that's really realistic in terms of its violence and compare it to Trigger Witch, and it would be unfair to rate both of them M in a way. Um, so I think it's quite comfortable at T. Uh, there's there's no sexual content and no offensive language. There's a bit of smoking, um, but yeah, nothing too, nothing too major outside of the violence. So it's just kind of taking like a, a big picture look at the game and you know, what message does this game send? And yeah, what is the tone? What is the tone of the violence? I suppose. Yeah. Growing up in the eighties when like everybody smoked, it's still weird to me to see like use of tobacco as a rating descriptor yeah. in movies and games. Like <laughs> just everyone smokes, don't they? <laughs> Being a kid, everyone did. I, I used to have to run into the gas station to get my mom cigarettes. That was nothing yeah. back then. <laughs> I used to buy my dad's yeah. cigars for him. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't get away with it now. Yeah, I think my um, yeah, my mum was, you know, of uh, even earlier era where it was the same. I think when she would be nine or ten years old and be able to go down and buy buy cigarettes for her dad. Um, in New Zealand, there was actually no age restrictions on cigarettes until I'm not even sure the eighties. But yeah, ten oh, year olds wow. could just could buy them for themselves if they really wanted to. <laughs> mm-hmm. That stressful day at preschool. Got to <laughs> <laughs> someone threw silly putty at me. I got finger paint in my hair. Shit's just crazy. I need a smoke. <laughs> uh, Carnage asking, what games inspired you? Being that it's a twin stick shooter, my favorite genre. Curious if you are a fan of Geometry Wars or Enter the Gungeon, two of my favorites. Yep, so I really like both those games. Um, yeah, they're, they're great games. I've actually been playing Into the Gungeon quite recently as well. And yeah, big big fan of that. We Obviously, um, Trigger Witch isn't a roguelike at all. We sort of specifically um, 
you know, veered away from that because there are quite a lot of options in, in that category. Um, but other inspirations for Trigger Witch would be um, there's a Japanese only game for Super Nintendo called Gunman's Proof. And it has, it has an English fan translation. And that is almost the prototypical Trigger Witch, but with a very different story and very different themes. Um, and, and it doesn't have any puzzles, you know, it has dungeons, but they're combat only. So we just kind of, well, I, I looked at that game and I really liked that game a lot, you know, played through it a few times. Um, and I just thought, Hey, you know, like this is a great concept and no one else has really done this. Um, and there's a couple of restrictions with the Super Nintendo controller. You know, it's, there's, there's not twin analog sticks or anything. You, you can only shoot in eight directions and it's a little bit uncomfortable. Um, so I just thought, Hey, let's, you know, take this witches with guns concept, combine it with what we already had with Reverie in terms of a Zelda, Zelda style overworld and, you know, gunman's proof. And yeah, you know, Hey, it might make a good game. <laughs> I have to look up this Gunman's Proof game. I have a feeling if Chris Taylor were here, he'd be like, oh, I know exactly what that game is. <laughs> Chris yeah, seems yeah, like I the guy you, who would know that stuff. Yeah. I think if you if you look it up, you can definitely see the, yeah, even just a Google image search, you can probably see some of the inspiration. Uh, we really took it to the next level in terms of uh, blood and gore. We have, we have a lot of dungeons, probably a more involved storyline. And, um, a very different setting, but the, the broad gameplay definitely is, is quite similar to that game. Um, and it's a great game. Yeah. You know, I'd recommend checking that one out as well. I'll definitely have to look that one up. Uh, Jono himself in chat says as a pixel artist, how do you feel about the inevitable comparisons to link to the past? Which pixel art has been your biggest inspiration? <laughs> so Jono himself is the writer for Trigger Witch. <laughs> I, I recognize uh, the name and figure that would be fun. <laughs> a fun question. To yeah. Bring up. Yeah. He knows, he knows this annoys me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, and, and, you know, shout out to Jono. He's, he really just made the story of, of trigger, Witch work as well. You know, he put in so much effort and yeah, just t took is the game. To we, the level is he who we yell at about puns? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a band. Uh, most of the time. <laughs> we had a we, we had a few um I think we had a few ones sort of locked down already. Like the the main character's name is Colette, which is a mixture of Colt and Beretta. Yeah. And then the one of the secondary characters, Remy, is of course based on Remington, the Remington shotguns. <laughs> um I picked up but, on that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, going back to the um to the question about Pixel Art, it's I think I think it's not a bad thing for people to look at a game and sort of you know people I people kind of make sense of things by what they already know and link to the past as a, as as an example is a super popular game you know it's basically an all star video game and so yeah yeah a lot of people are like oh you know it looks like link to the past but that's sort of just kind of making sense of trigger which you know by what is already kind of known you know um so it's yeah, I think it's I think it's fine, and it's a bit unfortunate. You know, some people think that like, or the, the odd person thinks that we've somehow stolen artwork directly from it or something. But no, it's just broad broad kind of styles, and you you almost want that. You you want someone to look at your game and be like, okay, I sort of know how this plays. Um, so the similar viewpoint to a link to the past, people kind of know what to expect. Like, oh, okay, it's a top down game. There's going to be an overworld. There might be dungeons. Um, so it kind of just contextualizes the game. So it used to worry me, but it's a lot less stressful now. <laughs> I'd say being compared to one of the greatest games of all time can't be that bad. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> and John, I was saying the punny nature of the game was established before you arrived. Uh, would you like to defend yourself from these accusations? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I like to think of it as a shared effort. <laughs> Bend them all. I understand. I'm following directions here. <laughs> well, people say that they don't like puns, but really, who who hates puns? Uh, Paul does. <laughs> deep down, <laughs> deep down in your soul, you know that you love them. They make me cry in my sleep at night. I, my husband wakes me up and he's like, "Cole, Cole, you were sleeping. Why are you crying?" Uh, I dreamed of a pun. <laughs> <It was bad. laughs> yeah, you continue to play the Paugi games from Lightwood Games. <laughs> yeah, I, my love for word games 
triumph outweighs your hatred over for puns. My hatred for puns. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Unmog Carnage. I'm a fan of him old. now, though. <laughs> Band Carnage. Get out of here. Which puns don't you like? <laughs> Are you triggered by puns? <laughs> Carnage, you're such an asshole. <laughs> I'm gonna ban him. <laughs> He's a mod. You can't ban him. <laughs> Listen, don't test my ability. <laughs> <laughs> you'll find a way. You'll you'll hack Twitch and make it possible. <laughs> who's who's the, the owner of Twitch? Let me go be friends with him, and then I'll make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh my lord! So Dan, what are you playing these days? When when you're not working on creating Trigger Witch, what are you playing? What are you enjoying? Um, I haven't been playing too much recently. Um, I've been enjoying Sakuna, Sakuna of Rice and Ruin. And, um, yeah, I, I always come back to sort of arcade shoot 'em ups, you know, the vertical scrolling arcade shoot 'em ups. I think they're great. Um, and yeah, there's not, has been too much on the agenda. Um, the Outer Worlds, that, that kind of first person, RP, uh, first person shooter RPG by Obsidian. Mm-hmm. I've been enjoying that as well. Um, so yeah, my, the current games I'm playing is it's very different from what I used to play. You know, a couple of years ago, I I pretty much only played Vita games, <laughs> and, and I really liked you know dungeon dungeon crawlers, those first person dungeon crawlers like uh, Demon's Gaze, um, you know Stranger of Sword City. Yeah, these are weird niche games, but yeah, I quite enjoy those sorts of ones. Um, Again, I wish Chris Taylor was here. He's yeah. he's at a Cram- uh, King Crimson concert tonight, so I guess. Can't be too mad at him. He's having fun. <laughs> He's enjoying himself. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm known amongst amongst the you know the Rainbite team of you know the guy that has the weird taste in games. So yeah, <laughs> who has the weird taste in games? <laughs> who else? <laughs> uh, I I don't think I don't think the other guys are particularly you know eclectic in their tastes. But yeah, we, we all like a good game, right? It's it's. Whether it's niche or whether it's mainstream, a good game is always a good game. So, <laughs> Jono saying Glockamoly, all time great gun pun. Yeah. <laughs> Glockamoly. Yep. Oh my God. That's had a few special shout outs. <laughs> oh, this is awful. Just absolutely awful. <laughs> I love, I just, I can't get enough of terrible, terrible puns. That's why I write them down and rip them up because they're terrible. Well, you must like Trigger Witch then. So. <laughs> Cole, Cole hates me right now because I said that. I, how do I hang up the call? Where's the button? <laughs> I'm done here. It was a good run. It was like 480 some odd shows for me. But the puns have bitches. just gotten too much. <laughs> That'd be great if, if you just came onto a show and our entire show just imploded. She quit the show. This is like our <laughs> final episode. And you're like, I just came on to talk about Trigger Witch. <laughs> <laughs> it's me and you from here on out, Joe. I'm taking over. <laughs> Bye, Cole. Everybody's <laughs> vying for my job. <laughs> <laughs> we just talked about this on the last episode. I was like, wow, we made it 700 episodes and everybody's still just waiting for me to quit. <laughs> it's because it's a running theme. All my co-hosts eventually quit. Yeah. You know You're- what doesn't quit? Hmm. Puns. True. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what happened to the other co-host. They got tired of the puns. Got tired of the bullshit puns. <laughs> can't can't deal with this anymore. Got to check out. <laughs> so I do have one question that I'd like to ask. Uh, if you could make go back and retroactively make Trigger Witch a shmup, and your team wouldn't fight you over it, <laughs> would you? No, 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 no. I keep it the way it is. Would you? There's nothing you'd change? No, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I'm really happy with the game, and I think this is the the best the best genre the nice. best genre for Trigger Wish to sit in. So yeah, that's it's sometimes good to have the, the moderating influences of the other guys. Um, you know, to kind of yeah, they take a bit of my crazy out um, <laughs> and maybe make us a bit more commercially viable as well. <laughs> <laughs> I you mean, you do guys. have the shmup elements in the game in the, in the bullet factory where you're dealing with the boss there. Flying yeah, through I got the, that one the factory. <laughs> <laughs> they had to throw me a bone. So. 
That was the compromise. They let you have that level. Yeah. Oh, well, I guess we, we like switching. You know, it was the same thing that we did with Reverie, where we have kind of a design philosophy where each dungeon that you go to, there is a unique gameplay element. There's something different that, um, you know, separates it from the other dungeons. And so that was just one of the tools, you know, switching up the gameplay to a vertical shooter. That was one of the tools we could use. And it kind of made sense. You've got to put, you've got to put broomsticks in there somewhere oh, for yeah. a witch based game. True. Um, so yeah. You yeah, could have a, made a, a gun twist. that was a broomstick that shot out like it's, it's little bristles. <laughs> <laughs> like an Uzi. It just well, we- shoots bristles really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Like one of those straw broomsticks and it just shoots a, like straw when it's moving fast will fuck shit up. <laughs> I think that, anything moving fast that, does. Well, yeah, but like I've seen, I've seen like after a tornado where like straw is like through a fucking telephone pole. Jeez. Oh, jeez. Yeah, you ain't ever seen that. No. That happened. What's the yeah. straw? What's the straw made out of? Where you're from? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It is that redneck straw. We're we're built different. <laughs> 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 you can tell by the sound of her voice. <laughs> <laughs> I let the redneck fall out there for a minute, just to just to make the joke land. Uh, <laughs> 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 but yeah, uh, yeah, it happens. Straw moving fast. You could have made a gun with straw. Would have been hilarious. <laughs> Mr. 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 Shot there. An update. <laughs> yeah. Any, any ideas on the sure. cutting room floor that could possibly make their way in via an update or DLC? Is that possible? Well, there's, there's a couple. We are, we actually do have a patch on, on the way for a couple of nice quality of life changes. Um, but Ooh. yeah, there's kind of not that much room in the game for any, um, you know, big additionals. Um, but one, one gun that I did want to get in there somehow, but it, it didn't make it in was a cash gun mm. that, that you would get from the casino. Nice. And, and um, just shoot your gems. Yeah, so it would shoot shoot cash, and so instead of there being an ammo bar, it would take out of your currency. Oh, that's awesome! I've been yeah, spending so way still- too much money in that because, or way too much time in that casino. I I just got the familiar last night, and I'm trying to save up for all the other stuff in there. Shooting those little poor yeah. blobs into the spikes over and over. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we like adding little, you know, mini games like that. Um, I suppose switching up gameplay styles. Of course, in the first, uh, in our first game, Reverie, there was the arcade with a with a vertical shooter, and so it's just nice to have that. You know, the, if the player is getting, if, if things get a little bit stale, or the the player just wants to switch things up, then they can just go enjoy the mini game and uh, relax for a while. So nice. Well, Cole, what other questions do you have? I know we've been chatting for quite a bit. Well, I got to ask the big one that was on my mind about. About what would be changed, or if there was a potential for a broom gun. So now I don't really have anything else. I kind of <laughs> I drained all the good thoughts right there. Oh jeez! You, you side side swiped me with the the confusion over straw going through telephone poles. I thought everybody'd seen that. <laughs> now I don't know how to. Now, now I don't you're know just how to lost. Carry on, yeah. Now you, you guys just got to go Google image that shit. And <laughs> straw through that telephone pole. <laughs> After a tornado. The tornado part's important. <laughs> All right, I'm looking this up. Yeah, there, there's a piece See? of straw through a telephone pole. Told you. Yeah. I know what I was talking about. Yeah. Uh, we that, really missed the trick right there, not putting yeah. that gun in. <laughs> yeah, it's for a future update. You're welcome. Trigger Witch uh, 2. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking of, what is next for Rainbite? Is any projects in the works? Anything you're planning? Yeah, so um, we're just going to be, you know, patching the game up. We've got a patch coming out for all platforms, um, and then porting as well. Um, you know, eventually to PC and Mac, and also looking at bringing Reverie across to Xbox and PC and Mac. So that that's kind of on the horizon. Trigger Witch was a really long, you know, quite a long development process. It was pretty. It was pretty tough. It was a lot tougher than our previous titles. Um, so. I don't know if anyone's wanting to jump into a real, another big game anytime <laughs> really soon. Um, and so I think we're, we're probably just going to, you know, yeah, port what we have and then maybe do our own projects for a while. And then when the time is right, we'll, we'll all come back together, you know, reunite the team for, a, you know, for, for another one. 
for another big one. Hopefully. You guys all have day <laughs> jobs. Is Rain Bite like a side project for you guys? Uh, yes, we all have other jobs at the moment. Um, yeah, getting towards the end of Trigger Witch, you know, things were getting really tight and Trigger Witch development lasted way longer than we thought. But, um, you know, you sort of two and a half years, but we wanted to make the game as good as it, as good as it could be. So there's no real point in rushing it out only to be disappointed by it. Um, yeah, so we're all two and a half jobs. years isn't that bad for a game like this. I have, sure. I have some friends who've been working on a game literally since our first episode. It's been in planning stages and they're still working on it. That's been eight years. So I know how long games can take. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they can. They can. We have, we have a couple of ways to make them go, you know, faster. I think one, one issue is that people, as they start making a game, they're like, oh, let's add this in and this will be even better. And so the scope of the game just increases so just much. Gets bigger and, that, and bigger. Yeah. And with time, that, that starts to become exponential in terms of the amount of time it takes. So, you know, we kind of really lock, we lock down the scope of the game. Uh, at a relatively early stage and then you know whenever i want to add more shmup sections in the other guys are like no 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 <laughs> listen dan we've talked about this no more shmup section <laughs> just, just one more guys please <laughs> i swear it's my last yeah oh my lord well i know we've been chatting for quite a while is there anything else that you wanted to talk about that we didn't bring up um oh not too much. I think it's been pre pretty thorough, but just wanted to thank everyone who's you know played the game and played through it, and um, yeah, hope you enjoyed the twist uh, at the end of that at the at the end of the game uh, for sure. I, I so. didn't get to the end yet, so don't spoil it for me. I've been I've been grinding gems and wasting too much time in the casino to actually you know beat the game. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't I don't want any spoilers. <laughs> no, no, I'll no get spoilers. there. I will you'll, you'll never get guess, there. though. You'll never guess, which which means, yeah, yeah. You'll you'll never have worked it out. Was the magic <laughs> in their hearts the whole time? <laughs> the friendship certainly was. It was, it was but, friendship. Yeah, friendship is friendship. magic. Yes, the power of friendship. <laughs> <laughs> well, give us the sales pitch one more time. Where is the game? How much is it? Where can people get it? What do they do? Give us all the info. Sure. So Trigger, which is out now on uh, PlayStation and Xbox and Nintendo Switch, it uh, it's normally $15, uh, but as it's launch week right now, it's actually 10% off. Uh, might not be by the time you hear this. So, uh, but yeah, it's basically $15 and it's a top-down Zelda-like with twin-stick shooter gameplay set in a fun, magical world with lots of guns and lots of gore or pinata, you know, or confetti, if you like that. <laughs> And Tim gave it a buy it, so it's worth checking out. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. We're going to take a quick break with the show. We will be back with more. We will be back with our party cast. We have reviews to take care of. Cole, you'll still be here. Yep. Uh, Dan, it was a pleasure having you on the show. It was a really good chat. I can't wait until Reverie makes its way over to Xbox. Definitely keep us updated on that. And uh, if that happens, you'll have to come back on and chat with us again. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. And uh, I'll definitely keep you updated on Reverie. But you've got to keep me updated on the ending of Trigger Witch once you finish it. <laughs> will do. Absolutely will do. Uh, yeah, do you have any final words? Uh, no, just thank you very much uh, for having me on. And uh, thanks for everyone who's you know, supported us and shared, our, shared Trigger Witch on social media and bought the game. And I really hope you enjoy it.
Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for sticking around. Another thanks to the team at Rainbite for coming on, joining us. Dan was awesome. Uh, Cole, what'd you think? It was a good chat. It was a good chat. Trigger Witch is awesome, and someone that could back that up. Tim Ekebis is here. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? Yeah, um, I'm hanging in there. <laughs> I've encountered like- sickness again for the first time in a long time, and uh, it's no good. I don't no, like it. Never is. No. No, but you know yeah. What it is? Um, I, not exactly. It's not COVID. I know that because we have <laughs> in-home tests, and I took one uh, because one of the kids I work with has COVID uh, yes. right now. Yeah. Like Pernell's here too. Hi, Pernell. By Hi, the way, <laughs> Pernell <laughs> doesn't have COVID. Pern- Pernell has become a okay. footnote. Pretty much. It's okay. So it was just kind of like stuffy and phlegmy, and I thought it was like over and then uh then i just like went to work today and i was like i had zero energy so i was like you know what there's not much going on i'm just gonna leave and take a nap <clears throat> and i did well hey naps are good first. naps are good uh so that 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 nap might be the only reason i'm here right now so praise <laughs> nap power napping it's the wave of the future yeah. today oh uh, pernell how are you doing how are things on your end I'm hanging in there. Though Cole, as Cole put it, Cole calls me a footnote, and it makes me a little sad. <laughs> Damn it, Cole! I'm sorry, um, now. It's okay. You're forgiving. You're still my friend. Um, I'm I'm hanging in there myself. I'm in a bit of a weird funk now myself, but thankfully, believe it or not, games and you know exercise are a good way to go about doing things. Weirdly enough, I got into this weird kick where I decided I wanted to not utilize social interactions anymore on social media or anything. So <laughs> I'm going for a good period here. Let me see if I can go for a streak. Um, though it feels weird because, you know, that's what you do with most of your time. <laughs> when you don't have that to do anymore, things get weird. <laughs> but, um, you know, reading lots of news articles and playing your Switch a lot. <laughs> nothing, nothing wrong with playing your switch that is true i love that little bugger um but yeah i kind of been doing that um and funny enough i also finally started on my pull-up goal goal being to actually do a pull-up. goal is goal being one yeah one pull-up <laughs> i've been there <laughs> the fun thing about like a friend suggested one of those like, apparently it's like a pull-up assist device which i didn't even know existed believe it or not and you can um, get, if you have a, a bar, you can get like a resistance band mm-hmm. and use that. to. That's what I have. That's that's how I got my considerable self up to do start doing pull ups. I might be something to do for when I'm at the house, too, because given how you know weirdness with COVID is taking place, who knows if I might be doing it the one to, if I want to do it at the gym going forward. But there's this thing that they have there where it's like a platform you can kneel on and then you set a certain weight assist level. And then you do pull-ups that way. And yeah. um, t- not TMI, because I'm not ashamed to admit it. I weigh, like, basically, I'm between 250 and 260 pounds. So yeah. um, I put about 80 pounds assist on there, which is basically saying it gives you 80 pounds that will just pull you up without you having to do it. And I was able to pull myself up with that. I was able to do, like, t- basically five sets of five, which I was like, wow, I can do more than I thought I could. <laughs> I was you prob- like- you're probably going to be able to do a pull up on your own real soon. Like from my, gauging from what I my process with that, you you could probably do it on your own pretty quickly. I think I'm looking forward to it, too, because like my dad was like, why would you want to do that? That's not really a need. I'm like, I'm paranoid. You see, I'm that guy who feels like you never know. It could be a day where I just happen to slip and I'm hanging off the edge of a ledge of some sort. And I really hope I can pull myself up in this situation because no one else is going to do it. And he's like, yeah, but what are the odds? I'm like, what are the odds? You don't fucking know. <laughs> Nobody knows. So that now, like, is like now you life. have me paranoid that something's going to happen, and I'm going to be on a ledge hanging for my life. Hey, it could happen. It could absolutely happen. Hate you, Pernell. Me, <laughs> people. Hey, people claim. Oh, well, what do I, what will I ever see a live bear when they're talking about you know play dead? You know, don't don't confront the bear. Just kind of put your arms up and look big. For a bear, why do I need to know that? I'll never see a bear. Next thing you know, you're at the fucking rest stop pissing in the bushes. And I'll be like, what the fuck? This is a rest stop. What's a bear doing off 95? Well, don't you wish you took notice of that lesson on how to make a bear go away? You wish you did now. <laughs> you know, you never fucking know. So, <laughs> I'm that guy who never knows, so he wants to be prepared, which is funny because I can't fucking swim. 
I've just gotten by <laughs> not being tall enough to stand in water. I can stand in water. That's been my life. That's been my way to get out of it. But I mean, you're what, tall enough. Tsunami, <laughs> yeah, but then the question becomes, what happens if a tsunami comes through? And the answer is, that's when the gun comes out. Because I know what's going to happen. <laughs> I ain't going to drill. Fuck this shit. I'm done. I'm I thought done. you were going to like start shooting the tsunami. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you like, shooting the hurricane in Florida. <laughs> I do remember that. It was freaking ridiculous. And I kind of wish one of those bullets had a camera because a part of me was like, I'm sure the bullet entered the, cor- the, the hurricane and it started going around the funnel. <laughs> like it just picks it up and grabs it. Yeah. Like it's once the moment the propulsion goes away, it's just another object in the storm. So, and then the oddest part is like it goes into the storm. The storm eventually lets it go. So essentially, does that mean that the, hor- that the hurricane fires the bullet? Murderous son of a bitch hurricane. <laughs> He's just shooting bullets all over the damn place. But that's there's your next movie, by the way. You got Gun Gun NATO. <laughs> gun NATO. Pretty sure that happened. That a gun fl- <laughs> a gun flash through like some like or like some rural town with like a abundance of gun shops and just like takes all the ammo and picks it up and <laughs> starts firing bullets. How do we stop this thing? Kevlar up. <laughs> Put on lots of Kevlar and pray to God. I'm just imagining the, the tornado growing arms and picking up guns. <laughs> it's, a it's like a man just gun, gun just like NATO grabbing coming all this the fall bullets. To sci-fi. <laughs> sci-fi network just firing bullets all over the place. Well, would Did you watch fire? that? Probably not. What if it started <laughs> eating zeering? Who? I only know his name because he's only on the one thing I've ever seen him in, which is like 90210. But he was the guy who was like the star of the Sharknado movies. So oh. the joke would be, what if, the, what if the star of Sharknado was in it? No. <laughs> I will I will say this, though. Sharknado is extremely stupid, but... Oh, if really? you ever get a chance, to, well, well, yes. <laughs> but I'm saying, well, I'm saying that because I know that's a precursor to say, don't watch this shit. But I will say... I did watch one Sharknado, and I only watched it because it was one of those Mystery Science Theater dealies. It was like one of their, their comeback specials or whatever at the time, and they made it hysterical. Like, I would watch If I could get more Sharknados with those guys talking over it, I'd be in heaven. So I'd recommend if you can come across that somehow, watch Sharknado that way because they made that shit amazing. <laughs> Lady McGree <laughs> says you should watch Lava Lantua. What? what? Is it like a lava lamp that fuses with a tarantula? Yeah, I guess so. Or just a volcano. A I guess that makes lava a lot more tarantulas. Sense, <laughs> that like makes far more sense lamp than lava lamps. <laughs> That's what I thought it was. Like this, like this, like this weird factory that has like, a bizarre accident where all the lava lamps fuse with all the tarantulas running around, and they way start to, running way around. Way to age yourself, there, man. <laughs> Far out, dudes. <laughs> Just a lava <laughs> lamp with spiders going up and down. <laughs> <laughs> I was that thinking was more of trip. like the body part of the spider being the lava lamp. <laughs> it's like sticking out of his back so or something. Like, yeah. So then just like, you know, blobby hot oil moving around on the and it being the back end of the spider. And then the spider could spit the lava lamp oil. Yeah. It's like webbing. Brilliant. See, Sounds we got like a, a movie, boss guys. fight in a video game. <laughs> we get, Brilliant. Get, get George on the horn. Write he that the down. Soundtrack. <laughs> Cole Write that do down on one of your magic sticky notes where we have one good idea. There it is. We already got the we got the composer. We got the artist. We got we got the loud noises. <laughs> um we're good. I think we can do this. We just need a writer. Hey, you don't need a rat. We'll just like, pull a bunch of names out, words out of a uh, fishbowl. We'll just like, put it together that way. We're covered. Let, 700 episodes. Text. We don't need a writer. <laughs> let, let predictive text write the game. Oh, God. Start, start with, I was dancing, or I was walking, or I was shooting, and then just let it go. No, no, no. I have to start with, in the year 20XX. That's also an option. That might get us in trouble, because there is a game called 20XX. If that's the case, then I don't know what all those 20XX games are going to do. Like, they can't take, they can't claim that, and we'll fight it. Like, look here, <laughs> bitch. Mega Man says hello. You Get can away fight from whatever me. you want, bitch. I'm too poor for a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> gotta call it a favor. We gotta find a lawyer who's especially fond of Mega Man games. Like, they're uh-huh. trying to claim that bit. Can't let him do that. 20XX is for everyone. It's for the people. <laughs> 
So should we do reviews? <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> like this script. <laughs> Tim, you get over there. You all right? Yeah, I'm hanging in there. Like Tim, a hair and a Tim's biscuit, like, huh? let me get the fuck out of this place. <laughs> Like these guys are talking about books and. Plants. I don't remember if it was on the show or the pre-show that I was talking about being sick, but just in case it was the whichever one was the pre-show, it's that I'm not feeling great. So there, that's why. So <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll get to the reviews. Let's, get, Let's get through these. We got a bunch to talk about tonight. Uh, first game to talk about is The Ascent, developed by Neon Giant, published by Curve Digital, released July 29th on Xbox One, Series X and S, Steam and Windows 10 for $29.99. The Ascent is a solo and co-op action shooter RPG set in a cyberpunk world. The mega corporation that owns you and everyone else, The Ascent Group, has just collapsed. Can you survive without it? Uh, Pernell, tell us about your time with The Ascent. Honestly, I think despite this being the headliner game, the nature of the game will make this review fairly short, I think, honestly, because what this game is, is essentially is uh, a cyberpunk. Well, you probably just said this and I just didn't catch it. It is a cyberpunk, you know, twin stick shooter with RPG elements and pretty funny dialogue in certain cases, most notably being the guy, your I quote, quote, unquote, your handler, the guy who's responsible for you doing your odd jobs for the corporation. Um, so, but the idea behind the game is that, you know, you're working in the, in the shit mines and I'm pretty honestly calling it that cause that's may as well be what you were in. Um, and after you come out of your actual job working down there, just to pay your way on this planet you're living on, you come to find out the order is diff- the, the whole natural order has kind of shifted. <laughs> and now all these indentured servants have had their leashes removed because the company that owned them is bankrupt and <laughs> the planet is pretty much lawless so your main missions for the most part are to work with your like i said the aforementioned handler to try to get things in order and keep things from going completely bonkers in regards to the loss of the ascent corporation however you also of course will find across come across a ridiculous number (laughs) of side missions which will bless you with bless you twice um (sighs) However, you know what else is blessed? Subbies, or whatever the, the thing is you do. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I wish, I wish that was, that would have been perfect timing for some biddies. Um, but, uh, oh my God. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Um, so, as you're performing these missions, the way it isn't working that you're kind of running around this massive, like, space planet. Um, I mean, I honestly love the look of this place. It is a neon multi-leveled city. Um, staircases, very vibrant atmosphere, people standing around having conversations. Sometimes you'll just walk past people just chatting. You can like walk up to them and have a conversation with them. That doesn't mean anything, which is a good thing because it just means there's nice flavor text if you want to experience this cyberpunkish world. Um, so you're pretty much running around this place and are engaging it and just exploring it. But, either in an actual active gunfire environment or sometimes in the city itself. Sometimes people or robots or droids or whatever will just give you the semi side eye and go, look here, dude, I'm going to kill you. And when that happens, the gunfire starts off. And the way that ends up working is at this point, your character will draw their gun. You'll be able to do twin stick dancing, right thumb stick to aim, left thumb stick to juke, A button to do your dodge roll, which has a short cool down, and you will be firing gunshot. Um, you have a main weapon and a sub weapon, which can be switched between with the Y button. You have a grenade, which unlike a lot of other games, you don't just have a supply of grenades. You have to actually charge a meter, which is done by doing damage to a foes, which eventually charges up. And you can throw one grenade. I have mixed feelings about that, but eh, it means I don't have to re- I won't rely on them, and I'm also not counting inventory of grenades, so it's not all bad. Um, yeah, also I actually guns, kind of prefer that method because it encourages you to use it instead of sitting on a stockpile. That is very true, and every time I had one, the moment I saw more than like three guys show up, I'm like, get out! <laughs> Just lob that bad boy. And also, speaking of that, I also like how the gun ammo isn't ammo. Um, you don't have to count your bullet stock. You don't have to worry about finding shotgun shells or plasma rifle shells. It's just you have a capacity, you run out of bullets, and you just reload and keep going. There is no bullet limit, which is freaking great because you 
You can pay if you're the pay and spray type, you can do that. If you're the precisionist, you can do that because you don't want to reload too soon. But all in all, you can fire guns at will, and that's freaking great. Um, in addition to that, you also have two augmentations, um, one for the left bumper and one for the right bumper, which can be any number of things, but primarily various types of attacks and like defense maneuvers and stuff like that, which you can trigger. And when you use them, they then have a cool down and you can use them again. Another interesting aspect to this gunplay, though, is that if you use the left trigger, you aim up, which isn't a thing that is typically done in games like this. Oh. But <laughs> and, they, and an interesting aspect there is like, um, so like if you're running straight ahead, it's one thing you'll be firing your gun, blah, blah, blah. But sometimes it might be like a little like a bit of like a staircase or an upper ledge that you're coming up across. At that point, you'll want to aim up so you can shoot over le- you know, over into the staircase. Sometimes you might fight across fight against taller enemies, in which case you want to aim up so you can fire at the higher part of the target. And of course, it then factors into the cover fire system, in which case you go behind an object and you don't push a button like you normally do. Because a lot of these games, you walk up to it and press the cover button or whatever. But in this game, you push the crouch button and then you walk behind the object. And that is pretty much you being undercover. But if you hold the up aiming button, your guy will kind of like raise his arm over the object and it does almost seem like a pain spray style, uh, uh, a fire and spray system because even though you the player can see it looks like the cave character is just like I hope I'm hitting things with this gunshot <laughs> but um, that ends up, that's how you are able to tell if you are firing over the cover space and I honestly like that a lot um, this game is interesting in that um, there's a few things worth mentioning here that I need to mention. One, I haven't played this. Well, it sounds like you've been playing it, Joe, in which case you can answer this. But I haven't played on a Series X, but I have played on an Xbox One. And once you get into the game, loading is no big deal. But getting into the game proper, hoo-hoo, go make a sandwich. Um, you'll no, be waiting is, a minute for that game to that load. It is not that bad on the Series X. That is good to hear. So those so those of you who have Series X systems, play it on there. But if you're playing it on a base Xbox One, prepare for some loading. Um, but like I said, once the game is up and running, I think there's been like a few times like on like transition scenarios, like going like a like when you're leaving the big city to go to like smaller maps. Um, I've had moments where it might load a little bit, but nothing like as bad as the beginning of the game. Though with that said, I should note. I do run this off of an external hard drive, so maybe that factors into it too. I don't know, but worth stating. Um, the narrative, I mean, that kind of gives, I guess it's part for the course with games like this. I didn't really care or draw, get drawn much drawn into the narrative proper. The world exploration's been pretty good, but the problem is with games like this, when you're taking on like a jillion side missions with a lot of moving and fast travel and junk, and the narrative itself isn't particularly strong, more of an excuse to get you to do what you're doing, you just kind of don't care. Not to say that it matters in the sense that it makes the game bad, because honestly, I think the game is a great deal of fun. It's just... I just didn't care about the narrative. Um, a friend of mine gave me a good descriptive for it, which I didn't expect until he said it to me, but I'm, I'm kind of good for it. He said it reminded him a lot of Hunter the Reckoning from back in the day on the old Xbox, like as far as how it played. And I can kind of see that only with all the cool ghoulish monsters and stuff, primarily because of the, how the augmentation stuff works. Um, but in the end... I came away from this game feeling as though it was a great deal of fun. Um, I'd never heard of it until you brought it up to me. And now I'm kind of glad I do know about it because I honestly think this is worth money. This is a good time to play. And that $30 price tag isn't budget, but it's definitely more affordable than the general grand scheme of things that we're getting right now for like big releases. So I think this is good. This is fun. I'm actually surprised you haven't heard of this one. This is, well, I guess because you don't follow Game Passes much as the rest of us, but this has been like one of the big Game Pass titles for the summer. I'll be honest with you. Also, I think a large part of why I don't hear about games too much these days is that if it doesn't just get randomly mentioned in passing in like an article or something as I'm scrolling through like a news feed, and also doesn't help to have been off the media books, um, usually I'm just so inundated when I'm already playing. <laughs> it's like, I it's like I don't even keep up with the news half the time anymore. It's like, I'm just playing stuff. Um, you you so, should listen but, to the even numbered episodes, done. but then I wouldn't have time to play <laughs> stuff. Joe, I got to play stuff. 
<laughs> but like, but I honestly am glad that this this game does exist. I do feel as though it fills a nice niche, especially those folks who like maybe want to like, play some other more of the other recent cyberpunk games that either didn't want to buy them because of their cost or because of the reviews they got or what have you. I feel like if you're interested in just getting that cyberpunk vibe, you know, augmentations, neon bright lights, and the booka dooka booka dooka music, um, you're this is a good place to go for that. I think it's a solid bet. Oh, then twenty nine ninety nine. Your official verdict? My verdict is to buy. And if you got a friend that will co op it with you, double buy. Or if you have Game Pass, download it. And <laughs> if you want to buy it, it's twenty three ninety nine with Game Pass. Hi oh, there it is. Ching ching ching. There you go. Sale. I I love the the twenty percent discount with Game Pass. You can't go wrong. Is is that the flat cut? Like any Game Pass game is always twenty percent. Uh, either 10 or I, 20, depending on the age of the game. Because I have Game Pass now for a little while, so I might have to keep that in mind. Yeah, there you go. Pick up games while they're on sale, while you can. If you can. I can, baby. Cool. Well, next game to talk about is called Eldest Souls, developed by Fallen Flag Studio, published by United Label, released July 29th on Xbox One, Series X and S, Switch, PS4, PS5, and PC for $19.99. Fast-paced and brutally challenging, Elder Souls is a unique boss rush Souls-like experience. In a final act of vengeance, the old gods have unleashed a great desolation upon the world. Mankind's only hope lies within a lone warrior and his great sword of pure obsidian. Tim, we heard Souls. Uh, seems like you're on the job for that one, huh? Yep, yep. Your Souls, here I come. <laughs> so how yeah, is not- Elder Souls? <laughs> Well, it's fucking hard. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Surprise. Um, yeah, they're they're not trying to hide with this one. Uh, they are they are so brazen to put souls in the name. But like, even if they didn't, if you watch the trailer for like five seconds and it starts talking about, I don't know, just the, the tone of the narrator and like a moon being made of dust and I don't know, magical shit happening. It's like, OK, guys, <laughs> we fucking get it. Like they're hitting that tone from, you know, the lore standpoint, the desolation of the world, just kind of the way characters talk. And uh, yeah, by being a, a hard pain in the dick, um, that that's how it's going. But yeah, this is a boss rush game. Uh, that is all that is going on in this game is you have 10 bosses to kill. Uh, that's it. That's the game. There's some walking around in between that, but that, that, you know, there's no like random or there's no just enemy, like just, you know, fodder enemies wandering around. Uh, there's not really any th- much in the way of like puzzles to solve. It's like you explore the world. You got to find these bosses. You got to be collectibles and, or anything like that to keep you. There, there is, looking. there is items to find. Yes. There, yeah. there is items to find. There's like some NPCs that you can give items to and they will, you know, some, there's like a blacksmith, you know, you got to find a big sack of money to give to him and then he'll upgrade some of your equipment. Um, at least he says he does. I didn't notice a fucking difference. I don't understand, but whatever. That's besides the point or, well, it's part of the point really, but, yeah, there, there's items to find. Like, you you know, you'll need to find a key to get through a door or, you know, stuff for this guy, stuff for that guy. But there, there's not like that is definitely a very mild part of the game. Like it is mostly about like you are going to fight these bosses and you have to go in there and learn those patterns and emerge victorious. It is a overhead action game uh you are your dude is running around with his uh the the aforementioned giant sword of obsidian um you can dash you can uh charge up you hold down the button to charge up your uh this is the thing you hold down the button which charges up a meter which uh will you do a little dash and you'll and you'll hit the enemy but that also makes your your blade fire up and uh, then the meter starts to deplete. But while your your blade is fired up, you'll recover health when you uh, strike an enemy. So um, that's the only way of recovering health in the game. Like, I mean, you're only fighting bosses. But, yeah, if they <clears throat> whack you, there's, there's a bit of a push and pull of like, OK, you lost a bunch of health. So charge up your sword to hit him. It also does more damage. Honestly, I feel like when your sword isn't charged up, like the damage isn't even fucking worth doing. It's so pathetic. 
It's like always like, no, just if you're not hitting, if you're not charging up your sword before you hit things, like, what are you even doing? Not a lot of damage. That's what. <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> you good? every time you, every time I'm getting there, every time you <laughs> beat a boss, you'll get like a skill point. Um, there are three different ways to build your character and you can like undo skill point allocation and like redo it at kind of your leisure. But there's three main trees, one of which focuses on evasion. One focuses on damage. One focuses on defense, uh, and like counter attacking. Um, I kind of shy away from defense ones, especially on first playthroughs. Uh, cause I feel like that's more advanced stoof. I enjoyed the, the movement one the most, I, I think of the three, um, but yeah, they'll, they'll give you different abilities for when you charge up your sword and they'll give you like an extra ability that will hang out on the left bumper button that usually needs to be charged up from doing damage. Um, but yeah, you can freely reallocate your, reallocate your skill points at any time. Uh, even in the middle of a fight, if you want to, uh, I guess, but you'd probably die, uh, because the game doesn't actually fucking pause for no goddamn reason. Uh, I, I get why that's a thing in like the Souls games because they're kind of online, but in this, I'm just like, what are you doing? Just let me fucking pause. My phone is ringing. My child needs something. Uh, uh, just, just there's no there's no reason for it other than to like slavishly stick to, uh, you know what Souls games have done in the past. Um, but uh, another thing you'll get from some bosses, not all of them, is you will t- you'll take their fucking soul. Um, and, uh, you can then equip that soul in some different slots on your character. Um, the, there's like an ability slot. There's one that enhances your dash, one that enhances your charge, one that, uh, does other stuff related to like whatever you're teching into, which, uh, I think is generally a pretty cool feature. Um, and is a fun way to play around with things. Uh, though the first one they give you is like this grapple where you, I mean, you use it for traversal, uh, like once. Um, but in, in combat, it it can move you across the screen very fast, or you can grapple up to a boss. And if you grapple up to them and hit them, it, it like automatically charges your sword, which makes it a super useful ability. Um, uh, but other ones do other different things. Um, uh, depending on, on where you stack them. And again, those can just be kind of removed and mixed and matched, uh, however you please as you go. Um, so yeah, it, boss battle games are tricky because, you know, they have one thing going on, you know, and, and there's times when I very much enjoy them and times where I'm kind of like, well, this is fucking hard. I don't want to play this anymore <laughs> right now. Um, and this, like, man, it ramps it up. Like the first, couple bosses are pushovers the next couple are reasonably difficult and then the ones i have encountered thereafter are all a fucking pain in the ass um (laughs) is it kind of like open worldish that you could go where you want yeah it it reminds me of uh well it kind of like you know it's it's kind of linear through the first couple bosses and then it's like okay you can go over this way or you can go over that there's like two bosses you can get to in the next area and then like the world opens up much more, uh, and you end up wandering around looking for them. If, um, anyone played Titan souls, uh, it's kind of like that. I mean, it's not like one hit boss battle kills, but it's in the sense that like, you just kind of wander around the world, take in the atmosphere and try to find the bosses. Um, Titan souls developers of a uh, death's door, which we talked about last week. Um, <laughs> I would not have been surprised if this was a game they made, but it's not, uh, <laughs> So, yeah, you wander around, you find a boss, and then, uh, yeah, you start that grind of of trying to master their patterns and uh, figuring out w- ways to get into attack. And, uh, yeah, it's just it's just a grind at that point. And either you are into that or you're not. Um, I think the game has some decent tools. I mean, obviously, like, uh, there's, you know, dashing and, and the uh, invincibility frames of dashing is a thing from... It's pretty heavily relied upon in Souls combat. Um, instead of a meter here, you have a, like three or four dashes you can take, and then it slowly refills back up. Um, but yeah, it's like, you know, you, you get to a point where it's like, well, I have one boss I can work on. This is the only thing I can do in this game. So it's, it's not something I think you're going to have a good time if you sit down and try to just plow through it. It's like you're going to sit down, play a boss for a bit till you get frustrated, and then probably put the game down. 
Um, but will it keep you coming back? I don't know. I don't. So like, I have not beaten every boss and I don't know if I want to go back to it, uh, is the thing. It might just like something about it is not my cup of boss rushing slash souls game tea. Like it might be a bit too oppressive in it's a uh, difficulty. Um, but it certainly has an audience out there, uh, for sure. Uh, graphically, I think it looks nice. I think the world is really cool. Um, looking, uh, I think that I really like the music too. I think the, the music, which only really pops up in boss fights has a really nice, uh, mood to it. That's nice to listen to though. When you're fighting a boss for the 20th time, it's kind of like, ah, this again, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, and yeah, you're gonna die a lot. And it's the other thing is in a game with this kind of a very, a narrow scope, there's only so much you can do. Um, you know, other than fight those bosses, like in, you know, a more, a broader, more rich, uh, populated souls game. Like usually it's like, okay, this boss sucks. It's kicking my ass. Well, I'm going to wander around and like kill shit and look for secrets and try to like upgrade myself like a little bit before I, I try it again. And this it's like, well, you could just reallot your skill points into a different tree. And I should say like, you can't like cross, you can't have like some, dashy skills and some strength skills it's like you are committed to one so it's kind of limited what you can do even under that those those trees um so yeah like i, I mean i think the game is good as what it does but like you are probably gonna know if it if what it does is something you want to deal with yeah well it's 20 bucks so what is your official verdict i mean i think it is for, I, I think for the average person, this game is a try it. Like you're, you're going to try it. Like if it was on game pass, that would be stellar. Cause you'd probably be able to see, you know, how far you could get and see if you, it'll really sink its teeth into you. Uh, I mean, if you are the souls type person who is really, really, really looking for that challenge, like, yeah, by all means, sir, step into the arena and, uh, be <laughs> raked over kicked. the coals again and again. Um, but yeah, I, I, my, for me, it is a try. I think for most people to be a try it, but it, it's not for lack of its quality uh, or, or it not succeeding in what it's trying to do. It's just like a real motherfucker of a game, really. <laughs> so congratulations. <laughs> that's that's probably going to be on a box quote. It's like a real motherfucker of a game. The SML podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Throw that on your Steam page, guys. Gosh. Yeah. All right. Well, that is it for you, Tim. We will let you cool. get going, uh, get some rest, fall asleep. feel better. Yeah, sounds good. I'll see you all next week with a Vita game. A fucking Vita game. That's wait, right. Wait, what? Yeah, yep. buddy. <laughs> Vita talk about exclusive. I, I think I need to know what that even is. Even if it's what, what the hell still coming out on Vita right now? Wh- Witch Crafty is the name of the game. Witch Crafty. It's a nice. Metroidvania game yeah another witch game after i just reviewed one last week i'm all witches <laughs> yeah, this all witch this month. all the time all witches all the time so like it's october uh, yeah all right vita owners make sure to tune in next week to hear about a new fucking vita game on make 703 sure 703 to <laughs> yes i say make sure your memory card still works <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, limited run games just sold what is probably going to be the last physical Vita game last week in uh, which, Super Meat Boy. Which one is it? Oh, Super Meat Boy. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. finally did their their limited run of Super Meat Boy, which was like li- it's super fucking limited. Like I think two thousand copies between the limited and regular edition. So oh God, it's so it sold out in like under a minute like, when it went up both times. Yeah, I mean, like I was not looking to get it i am not a vita collector but i know that thing is going to be worth like so much money down the road yes it is and honestly even if i did want it i knew for a fact i wasn't going to pull it off because fucking limited run games oh my god especially when there's something on on the caliber of this one yeah that was i got yeah the what i'm trying to think the one i had to the only thing i had to quick draw in limited run games was the uh return of the oberdin collector's edition which i did get Ooh. That was like that was like a year ago. Yeah, what good, you, what good stuff came in that one? Um, well, there's a copy of the fucking book from the game, which is pretty rad. <laughs> nice. Yeah, um, I think it has a soundtrack in it and maybe a map. I don't remember. It's over on that shelf near me, but I don't want to. 
Oh, it's about to also be people. That means it's yeah. already going to be good. The, imp- the important thing is that uh, last week I was able to get in my pre order for a play date for uh, 2021. Play date? Yeah, good. Uh, is that going to be the next Ouya? No, fuck you. I can't believe you would drag its name through such. Mm-hmm. I just, I'm not sold on the play date. All right. Well, obviously, because you didn't buy one, but I am. Yeah. But yeah, no, I just think it's so cool that like. What it, is it's this a, play date? So the play date you might it's have seen. It's, no, it is not. It is this uh, <laughs> yellow portable system with a crank on it. With a crank as you have to turn it to power it up. No, no, that's its analog input is a crank. That is How have you not seen this? Um, wait, yeah, wait, wait, me, <laughs> it's me. <laughs> I know, but it's like it's been floating around for like two years now. And, and I'm just surprised that it hasn't uh, crossed your um, eyeballs. Yeah, so it's a portable. It has and the crank is kind of, you know, the thing. It's like, oh, it's the weird thing with the crank. Um, oh, this fucking thing. It looks like yeah, a Pikachu. <laughs> oh, OK, but. Yeah, so like kind of the the deal is that when you get the the system like uh well it comes with 24 games but they're released over the course of like a season so like every week uh two games will download onto your system um on a on a particular day and it's just kind of the fun of like you're getting a couple and like you know they're not like crazy bangers like it, it's a small you know a more closer to Game Boy power uh handheld um, but it's just like, you know, you don't know what you're going to get, uh, and they're all going to be, you know, these weird creative things. Uh, fucking Lucas Pope is making a game for it, by the way, uh, speaking of Oberdin, but oh, yeah. also it has a totally open development SDK. So you can sideload games, uh, onto it that people make, you can make games yourself. Like it has a browser based, um, game development tool. So I think there's just going to be like a lot of fun stuff to come out of it like it, it just like it speaks to me uh on some level is like okay well i might want to try actually making a game for this thing and it seems like it has a pretty uh straightforward pipeline for making it happen or like you know i just want to see what other weird little things like what weird experiments people are going to try to make uh for this thing and i can just download them because they're just going to be there on the internet you know yeah, that's, it's it just looks like, it's, interesting. I just, I'm not sure if I'm personally sold on it, but you're not. You didn't buy yeah. one. They should just called it the crank. The crank. The crank. Yeah. Well, the idea is when it's called the play date, is that there is a date on which the games come out for you to play. So, like mm. everybody who owns a play date. Well, I don't know how it's going to work because, like, I'm, some people are getting them in twenty, you know, at the end of twenty twenty one, twenty twenty one. But some people are getting them like in like 2022. So like, how does the schedule work? Is it like from the date you like first sign on with your play date? So that way, yeah, I mean, because obviously by the time some people get it, other people will have already played a bunch of games on it. So yeah. that kind of is a little different. But yeah, I don't know. It's just like I love portables um, in general. Uh, and it's just such a unique thing. I, I ha- had to. I, I, I have been dying to check it out. And, and I've been closely following it for years. So I was I was happy to get in and get one for 2021. So when I get my hands on it, I'll tell y'all about it. Nice. I look forward to hearing about it. Yeah. I look forward to hearing the crank yank. Yeah. Crack, crank yak. <laughs> All right, Tim, we're going to let you get going. You have any final words? No, I'm good. <laughs> good night. Good oh, night. Oh, you're yanking our crank. You have oh. final words. All right, next game to talk about is called Blightbound, developed by Ronimo Games, published by Devolver Digital, released July 27th on Xbox One, PS4, and PC for $19.99. Blightbound is a multiplayer dungeon crawler that tasks three heroes to venture down from their mountain refuge to face the abominations of the Blight, a mysterious and corrupting fog that enshrouds the land. Purnell, tell us about your time with Blightbound. So Blightbound is a game where, by design, it is meant to be a co-op dungeon crawler um at the beginning of the game you are already at the default given three characters you're given a mage an assassin and a warrior you choose which one you want to play as and the other two are controlled by the computer they take you through a brief tutorial um in which they explain how the game works you have basically every character pretty much has a variety of times that's even going on like that's that's gameplay general stuff so they go through a brief tutorial about how the gameplay works. You come out, 
and you're at a place called the Refuge. Refuge being your main hub of experimentation and gameplay. From there, you choose one of the three characters again, and then you choose one of the available dungeons that are available at the time of which to delve into. And off you go. So, again, three characters. The warrior, mage, and, um, and rogue. So each of these character types fulfill a specific role in the hierarchy. Mages are long distance magic attacks and also the group healers through AOE skills. Um, rogues and assassins are capable of pretty much backstabs for critical damage, bringing up like, you know, opening up, exposing weaknesses in enemies so that other players can do extra damage to them and just being sneaky, stealthy, wealthy. Um, and the warrior is just an angry brute who draws aggro and beats the shit out of things. That's his role. Um, and it's kind of nifty. Um, so all three of these guys are going down. You one controlled by you, two controlled by the AI. And you are tasked dealing with like a fairly basic mission as you explore. It might be finding some people and bringing them back home or locating a specific treasure or defeating a specific enemy or just resolving a weird occurrence that exists within the environment. All the environments you're spawned into generally take about, they're never really particularly long, maybe like 20 minute missions or so here and there. Um, but the gameplay as you're in these environments is pretty fast and loose. Um, like I said, the characters play differently, but for the most part, you get a basic attack. You get like a, like a follow up attack. Basically, every time you do your normal attack, you charge up a little bit with the assassin anyway. And then eventually you can press your special, the, the B button to do like your backstab attack. And the longer, the more you charge you put in up to three, the stronger it is. Um, the mage, for example, his charge ability, which I actually kind of like how the mages works is he does, he fires his projectile beam, like it's a bolt. And if it hits and kills enemy, is they drop mana orb, which any character can pick up. And once they pick up that orb, he gets a charge for his healing spell, which is the AoE effect. So essentially, his whole goal of charging is that. And honestly, I never bothered the warrior character. I just let him do his thing on the screen. He did his job, and I was happy with that. Um, but all these characters do these things. And there's also two other special attacks that have a cooldown effect after you use them, and then a super attack that you can use once you charge up your super meter. Um, exploring these environments is again fairly straightforward and simple. The puzzles themselves are even fairly simple and straightforward, usually hitting switches or pulling levers or dashing to a space before time runs out, that kind of thing. And at the end of every dungeon run, you have to fight a jerkbag boss. <laughs> if you can beat him, um, you are free to leave the dungeon and you will claim ex you'll claim loot. And every character that entered the dungeon for that run will get one level up to a maximum of eight levels. When you level up, you'll gain, you'll get three stat points, which you can allocate to a variety of stats. You know, the usual grind of like, you know, hit points or critical hit boosting and things like that, or defense ups and stuff like that. Now, in addition to all that, after you complete a run, you will gain experience for a variety of things, whether it is completing a dungeon run. Um, Sometimes you'll have to find survivors that exist within the dungeons. And when you survive, find a survivor and get them out, they can become a character that you can then play as. And I'll talk about that more in a few minutes if. or a couple of minutes. But, um, if if, being oh, the key oh, yeah, trust me. I'll go, oh, trust me. I'm going to get to that <laughs> in a second. Woof. Um, but you basically can find them. And the more of those characters you find, the more you'll get, um, ascent bonuses and a few other things too. And as you level up your ascent location based on getting those bonuses, you'll unlock merchants. And, oh, not, well, I shouldn't say merchants. You'll unlock merchant singular, uh, a blacksmith. You'll unlock bounties. You'll unlock uh, a place where you can kind of e shuffle the equipment of all of your characters around as, as you see fit. Um, and, of course, the occasional like free stat point for any character you've got. Um, so that ends up being, honestly, kind of the grind for the game. Now, here's where a few hiccups come in. And by a few, I mean a lot. Um, so the first thing. And this might not be a hiccup for certain people, and it's going to obviously be kind of leading into what my final verdict's going to be. But if you don't have friends playing this game with you, yeah, I wouldn't bother. Um, there is a matchmaking service. Uh, I tried it twice. I got nobody on that thing, which gives me the impression of just how many people are looking. And, of course, I know that's kind of shooting the game in the foot when someone's like, well, you need people playing in order to have a matchmaking system going. But for me, my general rule of thumb has become if the game isn't already pushing bullet, uh, pushing buttons to get like a lot of press and is like well known and played, 
you're not saving the matchmaking. You better have a you know a, a set crew of people to play it with. Um, because and the reason why I push this so hard is because the AI in this game can genuinely waver from extremely competent to moronically stupid. Uh, <laughs> I've had runs where the AI has done a fantastic job keeping up and doing the do. Never good with healing, though. Never good with healing. But um, generally, they're just good at keeping damage at a, at a, a manageable level so I can kind of roll with the punches. Um, but I've also had runs where they suck at reviving players because when someone goes down, you can do this whole, uh, I was guessing the Turtles thing, but there's other games that do this where you can walk up to them and press the button to get them off the ground. Um, but I've had many runs where the AI is really done with that. Um, I've had runs where some of the dungeon puzzles involved hitting something like a bunch of switches and the AI screwed it up in the way where I had to start it over the mission over because I was blocked behind a door that I couldn't get out of because the AI jumped off of a switch when they shouldn't have. So like dumb stuff like that. Um, but it makes for some annoying experiences that leave you wanting to just have another person playing it with you. Um, and it's worth stating that because, again, when you design a game to be multiplayer specific, but then also slap puzzles in there, you're going to have a bad time. Yeah. It's very rare you're going to have AI that can handle it, even the simplest of puzzles, which is games puzzles are very freaking simple. Um, next thing worth mentioning, um, the game's art is freaking beautiful. Just pointing that out immediately. Mm -hmm. But there is a weird side effect to this, depending on who you are. Um, when large enemies show up on the screen, and those large enemies summon smaller enemies who show up on the screen. And all of these enemies have effect attacks, generally involving AoE, and their giant red circles pop up, and your character's giant red circles pop up. And all these uh, various cursors and indicators are all over the screen while you're trying to juke in and out to do your assassin stabbiness. It gets a little cluttered. And by little, I mean a lot cluttered. <laughs> um... There were more than a few scenarios where I just kind of jumped in and prayed for the best because I had no idea what the fuck was going on. And then the AI guys were just generally doing what they wanted to do, how effective they were. Who the hell knew? They were just in the middle of the colorful chaos. Um, but that does make for an issue of playing the game and playing it effectively. Some people wouldn't mind that because they like the idea of the chaos and thriving it. And honestly, maybe it'll be better if you have friends playing with you and you can kind of you know, gauge who's going to do what and pull enemies out or whatever, but in my environment, fuck no. Hell, and this is going to lead into what you were talking about earlier, Joe, just the tutorial mission of getting in and getting out on a dungeon run took me five tries, and that sounds I'm ashamed to fucking say it, but guess what? It happened that way. It took me five attempts before I finally got to the actual game. <laughs> I believe because, you because I still haven't beaten that. Like, I, I haven't played as much as you because I've been covering, like, we've been covering way too many games on this show, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> right, Cole? <laughs> Cole's like, oh, I got the game. It's been a struggle. <laughs> <laughs> We're rolling with the punches. I, with the I've attempted that first mission three times. The first time I died in, like, one of the first few rooms, it was just... It it was sad. It was just bad. The second time I got up to the second person out of the four that you had a free and my game hard crashed. Oof. Yeah, that's one thing I lucked out on. I didn't have any crashes, but I've been hearing stories about the game having some real crash issues. Yeah. And like you said that the missions are only like 20 minutes. Like these missions, they, they can eat up a good amount of time. Uh, the third time I, I rescued all four people, made it to the boss, uh, all four of the characters that I rescued died, so the fucking mission was pointless, and then the boss killed me repeatedly. The AI would resurrect me, and I would die basically immediately. It was, it was just a struggle, and it was tough, and it felt like I wasted my time, and I don't like when a game makes me feel like I'm wasting my time. And honestly, I think that ends up leading back to the AI bits. I can imagine if you're playing it with friends who are like able to like get in and out and do things, some of those boss fights would have been a lot better. But like by that same token, um, I actually would not be surprised if the mission that you died on was the one that was my, my lucky roll because I, that the mission that I actually finally pulled off was one where I had to save four people and then you had to run to the right to exit the map. And as you got to the exit, the mob, the boss shows up, you got to fend them off. And, uh, I was juking him, but, and I ended up killing him, though it was close. And I was like, thankful I can finally see the fucking game. 
But uh, before that, like there was a boss at the fight where it was like these two centaurs, pretty much, and it was just a display of just futility. Like the tank was just getting mowed, the maid stuck to the healing, and every time somebody went down with the scenario you described, where you're trying to heal, you're trying to resurrect them. But either you got them up and immediately went back down, or you just had no time to resurrect them because the bosses were AOEing all over that bitch. Uh, it just wasn't happening. So it was, it's like you were saying, it made for a very frustrating time in that regard, which is why it's very much worth pointing out to people that that's an issue with the AI in a sense. Meaning that if you aren't playing this with people and you're putting your money on the table for it, I personally wouldn't risk paying the cash if you're primarily going to be paying it by playing it by yourself, even if you can rely on potential matchmaking because you can't guarantee matchmaking. Yeah. And I'm not begging on that shit. Um, so, but it's rough. It's a, it's a rough call for this because on one hand, the game's beautiful. Um, the combat when you're in it can feel kind of fast and loose. I do wish characters had run options, but at least when you're actually battling, it feels fast and loose. Um, but the issues that it has really drag it down a fair bit, in my opinion. Like, especially given the fact that this is a fairly crowded genre of game. Yeah. Uh, so I would say maybe there's some patches coming down the pike or whatever. Um, and if that's the case and they just they do some more updates, maybe add some more mission variety, maybe add the you know, more competent AI or heaven forbid, maybe even do a thing where you could, if you do have AI, you can switch between the characters so that if I want to play the assassin, but then out of nowhere, I'm like, you know, I need to be the, the healer because he ain't doing his fucking job. You switch to the healer and do the healing work. Um, I wonder, I wonder if character swapping is a technical issue, though, because I I don't know. I don't know if there's a reason that you can't swap characters. It would be nice if you could. Uh, I would love to see swap. difficulty options, honestly. I would, I would just love to progress in the game. I would love to feel like I'm accomplishing something. The difficulty level, that's, I think that's in the gameplay design, though, because when you go into maps, um, they give you like a difficulty level for the options you pick. Like there's, I've come across levels where the difficulty was set to easy. I've had some where the difficulty was set to impossible. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, fuck that level. Um, but, uh, essentially by design, they're just like, Hey, you can go, you know, from this level to this level, you can take a crack at it, but usually there's normal and easy options that pop up. So. I think that's just kind of a thing that's going to get stuck there unless they, I mean, because at that point to change it would be to say, hey, you can change the difficulty of the math when you go, but then that'll re determine the re-roll, which will kind of defeat the purpose of choosing from a variety of stages that are rolled for you each time, because that's another thing worth mentioning. When you leave the hub to go to choose a stage, you can't back out. Once you're at the hub, once you're ch choosing a stage, you're locked into those options, and I think that may have been determined so that you don't re-roll the stages. Um, but I feel like for them to put a difficulty option in would be like a game changer in that sense, like in the in the opposite sense of what we're talking about here. But the the switching character bit, I think, could be more feasible because at default, the reason why you couldn't do it is because they're all meant to be controlled by different people. And the boss are just kind of a stopgap to say you can still play the game despite being alone. But. I mean, there's there's really no harm in dropping a toggle switch in there that says, hey, just jump between these characters, but only allow it to work if you're playing with the PC alone. I mean, it's just it just makes sense. And it would alleviate so many issues like getting stuck behind doors that you can't hit the switches to. Oh, <laughs> like, no. it's like simple shit. Um, it well, would just make sense. No, nah, well, 20 bucks on this one. We need a verdict. I'm going to give it a try primarily because of the access to multiplayer potentially fixing some of my issues. But otherwise, if you ain't playing with friends, I'm going with the night. I can agree with that one. I just, uh, if it gets some patches and some updates, I'm happy to take another look at it. I just, as it stands right now, it's, it's tough to recommend dropping the money on it. And it's a shame because I really wanted to like this one. Like I, I have fun playing it. It's just when you die and you lose everything, it just, ah, uh, it is, it is so painful to feel like you wasted your time. They're going to tell you to blame it on the blight. <laughs> All right. Well, next game to talk about is called Apple Slash, developed by Agilvik, published by Rattlelake Games, released July 30th on Xbox One, Series X and S, PS4, PS5, and Switch for 4.99. 
In Apple Slash, he plays the mighty Apple Knight, wielding his powerful slashing sword, where you embark on a quest full of creatively designed combat. Cole, tell us about your time with Apple Slash. You're a little Apple Knight in a black and white world with a little bit of red every now and then, and you have a great big sword, and you're going to swing it around, and you're going to hit blobs. And sometimes you get to hit frogs, or at least blobs that look like frogs. Um, that's the long and short of it. Sometimes there's little puzzles. you got to figure out how to cross, um, you know, bridge areas in order to get to, to hidden items and stuff so that you can carry on. Or it's, it's one of those short but sweet and, and, um, fun, but doesn't overstay its welcome kind of games. Does that all make sense? Mm -hmm. Like it's very simple on its surface. It, it sets out to be what it is, which is just, a like short, a, a twin little, stick action adventure. Yeah, and it, and then it just goes. We didn't try to be flashy. We didn't try to do anything uh, mold breaking, and it's fine. We did what we did, and we did it well. I don't have any major complaints. Like it just, it's what it is, and it's fine. My only complaint is that I wish there was more. I do have one tiny complaint. I think when you're solving the puzzles. The enemies respawn a little too fast sometimes. And I, I can you, agree with that. It doesn't give enough chance to actually get through what you're doing before it just decides to inundate you with a bunch of blobs again. But dealing with them is is so mundane and easy that it's like, I don't mean that in a, in a negative way, but just that it's easy to deal with enough that like you don't overwhelmingly mind. But if it do, if it happens to you a lot on the same puzzle, then you're like, calm down. For just a second. Let me finish what I'm trying to do. <laughs> Give me a minute to look around. But that's really my only beef with it. It's just like, slow down some of the spawns a little bit. And hey, it's perfectly fine. Um, I, I kind of like the, wish there was a little more to it. I wish that there was some way to make your sword a little stronger. I know that there are powers that you can get. Uh, mm -hmm. It just it feels like, especially when you're grinding to get those final achievements, it just feels like you're swinging your sword way too much. And I would just I would like something to to speed that up. I eventually got my my completion. This is another one of those easy completions. Uh, yeah. You could probably do it in under an hour. It's not going to be a five minute completion. Uh, based on what I've seen on Steam, it could be a 10 minute game completion but not achievement completion <laughs> i think yeah. i saw a 10 minute speed run of the game i think you could probably just walk through most of it if you really wanted to yeah. <laughs> i appreciate occasionally that there... it slows you down but not too much <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate that there were little side quests that you could do with the eggs and finding the yeah. keys and it, it was cute after you found all the keys i don't want to give anything away but it was it was pretty cute uh, yeah. Pernell, did you play this one at all? Did you have time? Sadly, no. I got really caught up, believe it or not, in Blight <laughs> I was like, I gotta get through it. I gotta get through it. So, no time. I know, I know you're all thinking, but the game is so short. I'm like, every minute counts. <laughs> <laughs> well, Cole, five bucks on this one. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I'm good giving us a buy it. I think it's plenty worth five bucks. Sometimes you just need a nice little quick, easy palate cleanser, and here you go. I can agree with that one. It's fun. It's cute. It's worth five bucks. Pick it up. Yep. It's an apple. And you're slashing. Uh, yep. <laughs> next game is called Madness Beverage, developed by Console Labs, published by Playway and Blue Sunset Games, released July 28th on Xbox One for eighteen ninety nine. Become a space pirate and fight demons that were set free by the evil villain Manos. Travel through alien planets, forgotten caves, old castles, and dark corridors. And remember, be wary of what's lurking in the dark. For now, tell us about your time with Madness Beverage. Well, early spoiler, because it's a good comment to state, is that I genuinely wish I was reviewing Apple Slash Death Vix. <laughs> <laughs> because, oh, ouch. mercy. <laughs> Apple, ouch. <laughs> um, so this game, um, Madness Beverage, is on the surface, if you're looking at screenshots and the like, it's meant to kind of resemble, like, you know, classic, you know, first-person shooters, the Quakes, the Dooms. You know, that visual style. Um, and that was honestly what had me interested because that's my kind of game. I liked when games were like when FPS games were that simple and straightforward. Um, unfortunately, I then started playing it and things changed. Uh, 
the first thing to point out, which isn't really a gameplay thing, but it actually, I guess, and I think about it, kind of is um, the sound. So the it's a, like I said, at its core, is a general FPS shooter. You're running around shooting enemies as they approach you, exploring environments, and you know finding secrets and the like. Um, but my very first thing that I noticed when I played the game was that there was a weird balance between sound and music. Um, something that is normally resolved by going into the menu and adjusting sound and music balance. But no matter what I did, I couldn't get a decent balance out of this. And while you might be thinking, well, that's not such a big deal, Pernell. Well, the thing about it is, if you're, if you're concerned about the music, that's one thing, because the music was really low and the music I could hear wasn't all that great. But it's another thing entirely when you're concerned about the sound, because the whole point is that as you're running around shooting, enemies will appear sometimes. Kind of like how Doom used to do it, where you might hit a raw switch or come across a door when you open it, enemies will spawn somewhere and they'll come at you. Um, they spawn in this game, but you never particularly know what's going to cause them to spawn. You don't particularly know how many are going to spawn at a time. They can spawn right in front of you or behind you. And many of the enemies don't make a damn sound when they do it. So you're just walking. Boom, you're getting hit. Who's hitting me? Turn around. Silent but deadly monster that shouldn't really be silent and deadly. And most important to note when I state all of this is the fact that there are monster sounds that exist in the game. But they're just sparringly placed. Like, you're walking through a castle. Where's it coming from? Well, someplace, I guess. Um, but I got to stop tearing on that. Let me talk about the uh, other aspects of the game proper. Um, the main idea behind the game is that you're, uh, I guess you're a space bounty hunter. You were tasked with a situation where a guy named Manos has removed the laws of death, essentially. At least that's how it sounded when you described it in the game. And then the guy, your main character goes, this is bad for business. I got to stop him. The dialogue is not great. Um, so you go to his castle to attack him or to beat him. You fight him in a boss battle, realize that he kicks your ass because, which is odd because I was kicking his ass until the game stopped. Um, and you determine that you can't win because he's powered up by a mysterious, turned out mysterious set of beverages. Um, and you go to a friend who tells you how to get them. And then you're tasked with selecting a stage built out of like sort of like a Mega Man style where you choose the level you want to go to. And that level has a goal where at the end, when you complete the goal, you'll get a cont- an ingredient towards the ma- another madness beverage. And these beverages give you stat bumps, but also a set of sort of stat detriment. Like, for example, one might say this allows you to do more damage with this type of gun or gives you more defense. But the trade off is that you might take longer to reload your gun or something like that. So. And then you'll be able to switch between them at the cantina base or wherever where you like on your ship, I should say. You can choose which madness beverage you want to take with you on a journey or something like that. Um, one thing I want to mention that was kind of funny to me was that uh, this is an intergalactic adventure. And when you have to choose what all the stages you go to, one of the levels is located on Earth and the uh, Pacific Northwest. And the description for it being like near Seattle is that, uh, Beware of lumberjacks. <laughs> it's just like, what? Like, so I'm fighting aliens and stuff, but the game makes sure to note that lumberjacks are dangerous. But, um. Magnus lumberjacks? The, <laughs> uh, is there any other kind? <laughs> 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 oh my God. But like, it's just, but, I mean, I, I took to play the game and like the issues I had with it were, like I said, the sound issues were bad. The, the gunplay wasn't even that great. Like you're firing your gun and there's no real sense of like impact when you're hitting guys. Like, You've played tons of FPS games, you and Cole have, I'm sure. And generally, when you fire a gun at an enemy, there are a few things that I think a lot of us have taken, started taking for granted. And this is a game that pointed that out to me. One, when you fire a gun, whether your controller vibrates or there's just some sound indication that your gun is doing something, that is an important thing. The other part is getting a visual indication that your shots are actually hitting their intended target. Oh, I guess I'll say visual or audio, whether the enemy's grunting or if there's like a slight like light splash or just something that indicates you're doing what you're trying to do. In this game, you're just kind of shooting. You know, like, oh, I, I, I'll know he's hit. I know I'm hitting him if he's dead. I'm shooting in his general direction. And again, this sound, I'm sure someone's hearing this and going, well, you just know how to play FPS. You suck. And I'm like, no, I've played plenty of FPS games. I played Doom Eternal on the harder difficulties. 
I get when I'm hitting a damn target. And in this game, I'm just shooting shit. Um, I only know when they're dead. I don't know if I'm hitting them. I just know when they're dead. Um, Jesus Christ, this game. Uh, <laughs> I, I will say, um, that Rest you do pieces, get me- bitch. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a funny line for the character to say, probably. Cause he does line, say it. It's like, it's over and over and over. Cole, did you play this one? I didn't. I watched Lightspeed play it. And oh my god, I had to just walk away from it sometimes and just be like, I can't even watch. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to hear that, that, that this is a genuinely shared sentiment. Like, this is a rough game. And as as Joe could attest, I'm usually really fair with this kind of stuff. Like, I'm very forgiving when it comes to game because I understand that sometimes it's like, you know, like a person's first game they're designing and they ask us to review it. Um, or, or just a company who's like, you know, we make games that are meant to be fun. We don't have to put a bunch of bells and whistles on them. I get all of those things. And I still can honestly come away from this game going, I was extremely disappointed. Um, I just can't recommend it. Like, I can't. It's, I can't think of any redeemers. Like, at all. And I feel bad saying it. I, I'd like to point something out for anybody that is listening to this or is, is hanging out on Twitch. If you know Lightspeed at all, Lightspeed Halo, you know he loves badass games, like bad games. I'm going to say badass right? as like games that are bad like, like ass. Like the games that normal people go, what the fuck, you know, like made somebody want to make this. That, that's Lightspeed's bread and butter. Oh. Hey. He tried to get a refund on Madness. Are you serious? <laughs> well, damn. I feel so much better he now. He tried to get a refund. That should probably <laughs> So did he not finish the game before he was like, I, I can't do it anymore? <laughs> he got soft-locked at some point. I think he did eventually end up finishing it. But he got soft-locked at one point and like, there were doors he couldn't get to open and there weren't enemies that were spawning. And just literally every 30 seconds, it was rest in pieces, bitch. And then, um, <laughs> Christ. It was terrible. You need to tell me why that bad son of a bitch is so strong. <laughs> well, he has the magic beverages, but we have some too. Like, God, Christ. It, it's definitely one of those games that's a choice. Mm-hmm. Well, it's an 1899 choice. Uh, Pernell, what's your verdict? Keep that shit in your pocket. <laughs> well, and just in case people are still on the fence, we're going to have uh, Jacob and uh, a special surprise returning reviewer <laughs> talk about to it on our next game? episode. To play this game? Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, my condolences. <laughs> yeah, ja- Jacob and our, our old friend CJ is coming back. Like, hey, talk CJ, about Madness you Beverage. You want to do reviews with us again? Depends. What's the game you got for me? Madness Beverage. Uh, he, <laughs> he, on True Achievements, he said he was interested in this game. So I searched it out. I We picked up a few codes, and I sent one to him. I, I wasn't sure if he was going to review it or not. So that's why I got you involved. Uh, well, Jacob expressed I interest. Refused. So, <laughs> well, I'll be perfectly honest with you. Then, if he was honestly looking forward to this game, I genuinely hope that he comes away happy with it. I really hope he liked it. Well, we'll find out on the next episode. So, one more game to talk about tonight with y'all is called Outbreak: Endless Nightmares, developed and published by Dead Drop Studios. It released May nineteenth on Xbox One and Series X for nineteen ninety nine. Recently, got an update with a bunch of changes and fixes. The nightmare continues for Lydia and her fellow survivors experience the true horror in this co-op survival horror roguelike. Uh, Cole, tell us about the, the new updates and the new fixes and whatever else Dead Drop did with the game. What happened? Holy fuck, they listened to me. <laughs> <laughs> One well, of my biggest complaints they, about they, this. They did the say they're basically making games for you at this point. At this point, yeah. That's what's um, up. I, I do want to say, too, though, that like Endless Nightmares has had the largest um player base for one of these outbreak games that they've had over the over the life of the series and I'm glad to see that people are interested in it and picking it up. Um I do think it's a really cool twist with the the roguelike elements added in with the horror. We don't see enough of that and so that's that's all very nice. Um 
previously I expressed my gripes and grievances with uh the the what's the phrase I'm looking for? I don't know. The the tendency for the devs to really hang on to that Resident Evil nostalgia. Oh, tank controls um, are designed. Yeah, tank there have definitely been some improvements in the controls, um, particularly with aiming. If I remember correctly, when this game originally came out, you couldn't aim down, and so you were constantly like shooting over the heads of the zombies that crawled. Ooh. Now that's fixed. They've done a whole lot of work. With the aiming, it's far more fluid and comfortable. You have better range with your weapons. They have certainly improved the gunplay a whole lot, and I am incredibly happy to see it. Um, you can you can point down at them motherfuckers now. <laughs> that's that's a nice change of pace. Um, a game changer, also, honestly. Yeah, it really does make a difference. Like in its original state. Not being able, I think I even said it was kind of unplayable with not being able to aim down. And just being able to aim down at the enemies really makes a huge improvement. On top of that, they've also changed some of the different um, camera modes. This game actually fucking just opens the door and says you can choose over the shoulder, you can choose first person, you can choose third person. They give you plenty of camera options. I don't know why that's not more common <laughs> in games, to be honest. Um, why we're always stuck with just whatever camera the devs have decided. And and the the ability to choose freely should be more commonplace. Um, my kids are like, are you done? No. <laughs> it's only 10.30. Uh, I know it. I mean, they like, they should, out of there. Go they to should bed. know. They should know. It should be like, like 11.30 and we're done. They're killing me today. Um, <laughs> Breaking your ball. So yeah, we have we have new per, uh, <laughs> performance options, 4K with with real time shadows. That shit makes a difference. Another one of my gripes with this before it was or um, before it was updated was that sometimes there would be enemies and traps and stuff in other rooms, and it just was. You didn't know if you didn't flip to go into the tactical camera and go explore the area before you actually went anywhere. You just walk up on shit, like traps and stuff like that, and have no idea. Now you can actually kind of gauge based on the shadows if you're using the the um the real-time shadow uh, modes. That's, that's important to have that little bit of situational awareness going on. Um, so that's really nice to see. Uh, excuse me. No. <laughs> oh, no problem. Burp. I didn't burp. I just couldn't breathe. I had a moment where I was trying like, not to go. <gasps> <laughs> um, <laughs> He's like, this game is just making me so happy. I just can't. No, but I am really. If really I don't happy bring to attention to it, <laughs> that they've. They've gone out of their way to to really address what people are are saying would make the game more playable. And in a lot of cases, I say, oh, well, it's kind of just a quality of life thing. But a lot of the the changes that they've implemented for Endless Nightmares now, they're a little more beyond quality of life and like full on basic functions that we expect in a modern game. And I understand that Dead Drop really want to like ham fist in that nostalgia but to see them at least accept it and go okay hey if that nostalgia factor is what's holding us back if we can improve the game by listening to what people are asking for and adding in these modern um control options and modern camera options even just things as simple as just making the weapons more visible when you're in first person mode and and adding different types of of aim reticles depending on which type of weapon you're using those are such small little minute details on paper but, but in actual up. gameplay they really do add up and make a big difference well it's 20 bucks i know you enjoyed it the first time around <laughs> what do you think now yeah i give it a buy it i'm glad to see that they've they've you know, fix these these issues with it, that they continue to support it. There's even DLC planned on the horizon, two of them. Um so I'm I'm really happy to see where Endless Nightmares is going and I want to see where it ends up. And you keep saying they with Dead Drop, isn't it still just one it's guy? It's one guy. 
I, and I'll be honest. Evan. <laughs> I, I just, I use they as a, as a gender neutral. No. So it's just or a developer habit. neutral. Yeah. It's Dev just neutral. a habit at this point that I say they. <laughs> All right. Well, for now, that's it with you. We're going to let you get going. All right. Time to go dive into the bathtub and get myself some swimming lessons because, you know, I got to work on that. Full circle, baby. Oh, Lord. Yeah, we're going to let you go. We're going to bring in Chris Taylor. Isn't that fun? It is hey. fun. Yay. Pernell, do you have any final words? Tell Chris I said, what the hell was he not doing here? He could have gapped with me. But other than that, have a good night, everybody. Um, and it was a pleasure chatting with you guys tonight. All right, moving on. Chris Taylor is joining us. Chris, how are you doing? Hello from the past. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was great um, at the time of this recording. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> it's raining in Austin. Uh, it's very dark, like, even though... Well, it's, like, dark at a, uh earlier part of the evening than it would normally be. Is it dark Mika? Oh, I don't know. Is she here? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's just me. <laughs> no, Cole's here, too. She's, yeah, she's still here. sticking I'm around. Here. Yeah. I Cole ain't nothing. She's something. Yeah, I am permanently here. Well, no, you're not, you're not here for the last review. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> I already well, recorded that one. I am. Oh, yeah. What was I doing? <laughs> Eating dinner. Yeah. And I was like, no, fuck off. <laughs> yeah, Ooh. you'll hear that later. <laughs> yeah. A uh, review in the future. That was from the past. Yes. Yeah. Even further past than right now. It's fun when I record travel. the show in completely out of order. <laughs> yeah. Just like old times. Yeah. Good shit. So, Chris, <laughs> you got three games to talk about. You ready to dive into these? Let's do it. All right. First game to talk about is Darius Burst, another Chronicle EX, or wait, no, Darius Burst, another Chronicle <laughs> EX Plus, developed by Taito Corporation, published by In In Games, released July 27th on Switch and PS4 for $39.99. Take part in the galaxy's most awesome adventure yet with this brand new update to the arcade classic Darius Burst, another Chronicle. Chaos has devastated the universe as the biomechanical hordes take on humanity once again. Without the support of the human network, Work, the Silver Hawks plunge into the depths of evil fitted with burst technology and set out to liberate planet Darius. <laughs> Chris, I'm sure that makes yeah. sense to someone who follows the games, but I'm kind of lost on that. You know, it's <clears throat> it's one of those things. It's like, you know, there's there um, canonically, I think there's seven games in now. Um, to the Darius series, which is pretty impressive considering it's been going for 35 years and that they're just, <laughs> this is, Darius Burst is basically game number seven. Um, I think it might be game number six. I'd have to count them all. But anyway, don't, don't do that. Don't correct me. <laughs> <laughs> this was recorded in the past. You cannot change my mind. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, and it's Send always all just like. to the SML podcast at gmail.com. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go get you some chapstick while you're complaining. <laughs> I assume we still have some in the future when this goes out. <laughs> There's like 15 tubes left. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Oh. So yeah, uh, Darius basically always has the same story. It's always like, you know, we're the good guys. We're from Darius. The Belzars are the bad guys and we don't even know what they look like. They're biomechanical. That's all we know about them. But uh, the thing to know is that they drive big old ships that look like fish. For no reason. Just somebody was at a at an aquarium in a restaurant or something one day and was like, hey, you know what? Wouldn't it be great to blow up all these fish? <laughs> and <laughs> that dream that dream has been made reality time and time again. And that besides the fact that it's some of the coolest like weirdo music that you'll ever hear in a shooter, those are the two reasons to like main things to check out in Darius. Don't go for the story. It's just, you know. Anyway, uh I've already spent too much time on the story. <laughs> the main reason why anybody would be listening to a review of Darius Burst, another Chronicle EX Plus, is because they are like, well, there's already a Darius Burst Chronicle Saviors on the PS4, and it came out like six years ago, so what's this? And uh, that is going to take the most time to explain. Okay, so <clears throat> if I would have gotten the Switch version, by the way, we wouldn't even be talking about this, so... <laughs> 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 Thanks, in for making me play the PlayStation 4 version. Just kidding. Love y'all. 
I actually pre-ordered. <laughs> I pre-ordered the biggest collector edition of the Switch version again. Like I already got the Cosmic Revelation or the Cosmic uh, Collection, and now it's Cosmic Revelation, and I'm still waiting on it. Anyways, so uh, in way way back in the day before any of us were born, 2009, um, <laughs> <laughs> they released Darius Burst, just Darius Burst. On or Darius Burst, I don't care if you pronounce it that way. There's hardly any voice acting, um, but it is officially Darius. Um, <laughs> they released it on the PSP, and it just and you know they hadn't released anything since the 90s uh, in that series. So this game came out on the PSP, and it was just friggin' fantastic. Everyone loved it. So they were like, "We're gonna blow this up. We're gonna put this on a giant ass arcade." Um, version with two like monitors and like up to four simultaneous players and that is darius burst another chronicle um then fast forward many years later they were like we're going to uh release darius burst on the the vita and then i later they did on the ps4 but i think they developed it initially for the vita they were like okay so here's the thing (laughs) um Darius Burst Another Chronicle is too it's too narrow uh, because it's two, you know, screens side by side that are already widescreen, which is something they're known for. The the very, very first Darius game came out on a three monitor arcade system. It's Good Lord. You know, massive. I one of my bucket list life goals is to actually play one in person because they're very hard to find. Um, but I, I understand there might be a few out there still operating. Anyway, so in creating uh, Chronicle Saviors, which was the the home port version of the arcade game Another Chronicle, <laughs> um, they created CS mode, which is like t- taking this narrow ass game and blowing it up, making it bigger, and kind of pushing everything a little bit together and kind of remixing the whole thing to work on uh, TVs that we would have in our living room that aren't, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, 33-9 aspect ratio, I think, is what the game is supposed to be in. So that's what, what we got crazy in crazy weird aspect ratio. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's what we got in 2015, and it's fantastic. It you know, was a full-price game at 60 bucks, but um, you know, I downloaded it, and I've enjoyed it for, for a long time. Now, what we got on our hands today is another Chronicle EX+. Plus, which leapfrogged over Chronicle Saviors and is now out. Uh, so what this is, is this is um, a port of the arcade game that is just that, but with some different extra stuff. So what you got in this is um, that super wide-ass screen game, uh, you know, the another Chronicle, um, which... The way that Darius games work is that you start off in, like, zone A or, you know, or whatever, and then you choose, when you beat that level in the boss, you choose, like, you want to go to B or C, or sometimes B and Gamma, you know, they sometimes go by the Greek alphabet. And then, you know, the higher the letter that you pick, or the lower on this little chart that you go, like, the harder the difficulty, but the better the ending. Um, So, this one had A through L. That was... um. That, you know, was had three starting points and each one had three branches and then that that got up to the letter L. Um, so EX Plus brings in O through Z. So now you can play like basically a much harder. Um, well, not much harder. It's all hard. <laughs> these are very <laughs> these are generally very challenging shooters, but we'll get to that. Um now you can play through O through Z, which uh, gives you like a whole nother set of levels, a uh, whole nother set of bosses, although a lot of the bosses are kind of palette swaps of the original bosses. Uh, they're stronger and with, you know, different bullet patterns and stuff, which is fine. They've been recycling bosses since the beginning, so no problem there. Um, and so they put the EX mode on there, and um, so that's an extra difficulty layer, uh, you know, unrelated to the arcade version. They also have the Chronicle mode, which is another weird thing. It basically piles on tons, and I mean tons, of levels. Uh, you pick a planet from, like, this whole solar system of, like, different planets that have appeared in the series. And then when you do that, it goes into a grid mode. And then it just, it's all these levels on a grid. And you just pick which one you want to play through. And, you know, you just 
play it to play it or play it to get a, be- a really good score. Some of them have um, distinct like uh, limitations. Like some of them are like one life only. Uh, some of them are like only these items used and things like that. So that's enough to keep you busy for like ever and ever. <laughs> um, <laughs> and here's the thing, though. Chronicle Savior already had all of that. Uh, so Chronicle Saviors and and uh, another Savior both have all of these modes. So what sets apart uh, another Chronicle EX Plus is that they included uh, event mode, which if you boot up your copy of Chronicle Saviors on the PS4, event mode is there, but it's grayed out and says not available. It's so frustrating. <laughs> so in this game, it's there. Yay. Now with those, yeah. Yay. So what those were, uh, when the game was in its arcade run, because it was a network like equipped arcade, basically what they would do is they would have timed, that is to say limited time challenges that you could access from the arcade that were just like, you know, brand new stuff, although, you know, very familiar. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it was just all these levels and stuff. But once they were gone, they were gone. So you had to be there like at the time that these challenges were available. Well, what Chronicle Saviors has done is it's collected all of these, and now they're all available forever. And Chronicle Saviors does not have that. So that is one thing, one you know, one feather for it. You know, one check mark for it. <laughs> um, in that little the check mark and X's you know bar thing that I really wish existed for these two games because I had to ex- I had to research this extensively and play both games like a lot which is fine it's one of my favorite games. Uh, okay, so the other thing is that what's lacking in um, another Chronicle Savior EX Plus no not Savior <laughs> another Chronicle EX Plus. Uh, is that it does not have CS mode, therefore, the only way to play anything in this game is with that ultra-wide screen aspect ratio. Um, So you can't play, like, a nice full-screen game like they have on Chronicle Saviors. That's exclusive to Chronicle Saviors. Also, uh, all of the extensive, and I mean, like, probably $100 worth of DLC that's that's still available for Chronicle Saviors. I thought it wasn't, but I didn't check correctly. <laughs> um, but yeah, all of those extra ships, extra levels, and all that DLC that's available for Chronicle Saviors is not even available as DLC for this game, and it's not included either. Um, but they do have um, the Chronicle Saviors exclusive extra ship. Um, that's just a, another variation of the Silverhawk, which is the, the Darius flagship ship. Um, which is like a super powered ship and it's really fun to blast through and actually it has uh, 10 ships in total from throughout the series so the thing that they don't tell you um, I had to figure this out for myself is that you have to go into the uh, the parent uh, menu that is to say from the title screen access the menu not in the game and change your controller to either player 2, 3, or 4 each player has a different handful of these exclusive ships. Hmm. Um, so if you just go in with the default with your player one as controller one, you can only pick from two ships. Just, you know, the um, the classic Silverhawk and then the, the updated Silverhawk um, for the arcade version. And they're both good. But yeah, if you want to play around with, like, you know, the one from the, uh, you know... Genesis version, the G Darius one, you know, uh, the Gaiden one. I didn't play through all of them, but I did try out that uh, Murakama or whatever it is, which is the really powerful ship. You have to actually change the player and stuff. But that's anyway. weird. <sighs> that's a lot of talking, and I'm not even done yet. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. Well, like, that's the difference between the versions. Now, uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's still it's one of the like most fun side-scrolling shooters I've ever played. It, in fact, Darius is my favorite shooter series. Um, you get these like mega swarms of enemies, and of course, uh, it has the burst system, which basically, as you destroy these like just piles of enemies that they throw at you, it's more piles of enemies than like actual bullets to dodge and shoot. Um, then as you like do that, it fills up this gauge along the bottom, which, by the way, um, in Chronicle Savior CS mode, it's a gauge at the bottom of the screen in nice, easy view. In this version, it's right underneath your ship, and you need a magnifying glass to see it. <laughs> uh, but once it's full, uh, or ha- at least halfway full, you can enact a burst, which, if you push the L1 button, it 
it's this little ship that just shoots a straight laser like in one direction until it runs out or you disengage it with the same button. Um, or you can push the X button, the cross button, sorry, um, to like basically supercharge your own shot. And then that's really good for like doing extra damage to bosses and stuff, presumably because bosses very famously in this series do not have life gauges. So you just kind of have to guess when they're going to die. Oh, <laughs> But I love it. No, I love it. And the bosses, though. though. Yeah, I know. And the bosses are all big, giant fishes. And uh, (laughs) the best one, well, one of them is is a whale, (laughs) and he has the best name I think in all of video game villainy. The whale is called Great Thing. (laughs) Great Thing. Great Thing. It goes all the way back to the beginning of the series. Sometimes you fight just this giant sperm whale, and it's an epic battle. Like, it's usually the the final battle in the game, um, depending on which game it is. But yeah, it's a huge whale called Great Thing. Lord. Yeah. <laughs> so well, that... that <laughs> well, we should probably wrap this one up. Uh, Darius yeah. Burst, another Chronicle EX Plus, is 40 bucks on Switch and PS4. Also available physically, if people are into that. Uh, what are your thoughts? Okay, so again, I have thoughts there, but uh, so Cosmic Revelation is going up for the Switch is going to include this game plus uh, you know, uh, G G Darius, which is the prior game in the series. That's the 1998 PlayStation and uh, Saturn game. And uh, if you can get Cosmic Revelation, that is good. Like, you definitely should do that, especially for the HD remake of the of G. Darius. Um, if the game is just physically available by itself, that's weird. Um, and then downloading it by itself, I would say, you know, if that's what your option is, then I would do it for the Switch. Uh, for PS4, you might uh, consider what I've said and just, you know, for the twenty dollars less that the uh, at full price that the another Chronicles uh, EX Plus costs, you know, I, I'd consider I'd weigh it against the Chronicle Saviors, and that and personally, I think Chronicle Saviors is the better investment, uh, especially for the CS mode because that looks it's it looks and is really fun to play on like your actual TV, whereas this one is not a more authentic arcade experience, but most of what you get out of this one is already on Chronicle Savior. So, uh, you know, it's a tricky one to recommend, but either way, if this is like, if you're just it, in a vacuum, if it's buy it or don't buy it, absolutely buy this. It's a fantastic shooter. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> hey, in in games, bring this shit to Xbox, please. Cole, I know you would like to try. Yeah. I know you love your shmups. I do. I'm kind of sad I don't get to play this. Aw. I, I am really looking forward to getting my collector's edition of Revelations on the Switch. So What all's in it? Uh, it is, well, um, so it is another Chronicle EX Plus, which, again, is the only one that's out on Switch. And we're probably never going to get Chronicle Saviors because the publishing has changed hands now. So getting Chronicle Saviors, it might not ever happen on Switch. So, you know, in that sense, I'm I'm fine with that. Uh, you also get the HD remake in also original version of G Darius. And also, apparently, with the special edition, they've thrown in uh, the Game Boy version of Sagaya, which is a <laughs> in another strange turn of uh, fra- uh, you know naming the games all weird. Uh, Sagaya is actually a port of Dar- uh, D- of the original Darius, but on the Game Boy. Huh. Yeah, I actually have the Game Boy card. It's amazing. I mean, it's a really good shmup on the Game Boy. Like, who would have known? Man, I wish you were here for that Rain Bite interview. <laughs> <laughs> Me the, too, but... The man. old games we were chatting about during that... Uh, Cole, do you remember what the, the there, Super Nintendo game was? I don't remember, was? but man, like every few sentences, Joe was like, man, I wish Chris was here for this. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a useless co-host who doesn't know shit about that stuff. Mm. What was my excuse for not being there? Uh, you were at your King Crimson concert. Oh, yeah. That was extremely fun, too, so I guess I didn't miss much. <laughs> yeah, I would have went with the concert, too. Yeah, the concert was more expensive. <laughs> Anyway, next game to talk about is called Orbals, developed and published by Farsight Studios, released August 4th on Xbox One, Switch, PS4, and PC, 
For $29.99, Orbals is a fast-paced rolling adventure puzzle game with wonderful graphics and sound. Quickly solve puzzles to master the Mojo Meter, find new Orbals characters, mm-hmm. and unlock special abilities. Chris, tell us about your time with Orbals. Okay. For one, I didn't know it was that price. That's uh, I have to readjust my attitude about this game. Um, <laughs> just kidding. You know what's weird? I have Twitch pulled up, just in, cause even though there's no party cast. <laughs> uh, like I'm just staring at like Twitch's front page while talking because I'm so used to doing that now. Uh, okay, so Orbals, what this is, um, basically you control an Orbal, which is a rotund animal. Um, initially, it is a kind of fox wolf mammal. It's kind of too cartoony to really be able to tell. I think it's supposed to be a fox. And um, so you basically start off as a certain color, like let's say red. I think red is the default anyway. And you roll around uh, the stage like with the one stick. I was uh, I was for some reason thinking it was going to be like Katamari Damacy and like you'd have to use two sticks, but no, you just roll around with one stick. And um, so... There are those mojo blocks, which are also corresponding colors. So while you are red, you can only bust the red blocks, and or cubes, rather. Only, I guess, blocks is fine. And um, then what you have to do is, once you do that, then you have to go find the next uh, light that is a different color, let's say blue. And uh, once you run through that, your character turns into blue, and now you can bust the blue blocks. And once you've busted all of the um, single color blocks, then there are these multicolor blocks that then become breakable. And once you've broken all of them, then the stage is over and you move on times 100. <clears throat> There's a 10 worlds, nine of which have 11 stages each, and then the 10th world is just one stage. Ooh. <laughs> um, I haven't gotten that far, though. Yeah, this is a, but, uh, this is a tough one. Yeah, like it... Like, once you get through World 1, it's basically fine. I was like, okay, this game's pretty good. You know, I'd probably recommend it for younger people because it's it's got a youngness to it, a youthness, uh, a youthivity. And uh, then I got into World 2, and it started really ramping up on difficulty. And, uh, yeah, you actually... So, um, you can get through the stage just getting through the stage, right? Like, there's, you know, not a whole lot of a risk here. But um, if you want to get a trophy, which I assume those trophies must be... Well, they give you ability points, which let you upgrade your character uh, to some extent. Um, you, you know, things like boosting, which a boost is just like, you know, as it says, you just push the button and your character launches a little bit faster, which is really good for strategy and jumping and stuff. And then I think other characters can do things like the chicken can fly for a short distance. And I don't know what the dragon can do, because I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> um but, you know, you basically, it becomes a thing where uh, it's got a gauge at the bottom, which just starts to count down really quickly. And you, in order to get that back up, you have to bust blocks and get points. And once it gets past a certain point, then you've lost your gold trophy, or you then you've lost your silver trophy, then you've lost your bronze trophy, or your bronze, you know, star, or medal. And then, you know, when it goes to the end, then it's like, okay, well, you passed the stage, but should you have (laughs) um so you know and then you don't i think you don't get your ability points at that point i don't know i didn't really pay too much attention i got a few gold uh trophies at first and then yeah i got tons of ability points i noticed they started to go down so i'm like okay that must be what this is um but yeah so there actually does become a kind of uh a game to it that is to say trying to you know get better at it to you know, get these things more efficiently. And the cool thing is that, you know, like a puzzle, you can kind of look at it um, and kind of figure it out. And you're like, okay, well, if I get red, then I can get to this. And then there's going to be a green block blocking my way. So I need to get to the green one next. But while I'm green, I need to be busting these blocks over here too. And then that'll put me closer to the blue light and then et cetera, et cetera. You know, you're like, you actually do start to strategize about it, which is really nice. Um, so yeah that's basically the whole game um you know they they throw little tricks and things at you but they always kind of explain what's going on which is nice um now here's the thing uh 
you know, you start off with this fox and they're like, you should, you know, roll, smash and fly your way with all these colorful characters. Yeah, here's the thing about that. Um, in order to get the next character, the ram, you have to complete world three, which means you have to beat 33 of the 100 levels to, to get him. And then to get the chicken, you have to complete world six, which means you have to play through 66 of the 100 levels just to get your third character option. And then you have the mother flipping dragon, which way cool. I would have liked to play as the dragon. You have to earn silver, a silver trophy on the final stage to unlock him. Uh. So that means the one thing presumably left for you to do with your godlike, you know, orbal skills is to, you only have one more trophy to get, which would be the gold sta- the gold trophy on the final stage. So, you know, it's a, uh, it's one of those games where I'm kind of like, man, couldn't you have made this like a pay to win? <laughs> and I could get my dragon early and then just, you know, blaze through the other stages, no pun intended. And throw a cheat code in there or something. <laughs> yeah, cheat code. I'm going to try Gabba Gabba Hay and see if that brings up uh, anything. <laughs> Cole, what are your thoughts on the whole uh, having to to pretty much beat everything to get all the characters? No, I hate that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I just like the idea of give me the char- the the characters are there. Let me play them. Yeah, I, I always get annoyed when you have to go through everything. Like, stop locking away components of the game just for no good reason. It's arbitrary. Oh no. <laughs> Oh no, Twitter's gonna come after me. <laughs> Save me from the anime faces. Nope. <laughs> no. Oh. Nope, you're well, on your Twitter, own. Twitter's definitely gonna come after me if they hear me and say if that. They would have at least <sighs> made it earlier to unlock them, you know? Yeah. Me. At least. But I just, I don't like it. I don't like it when devs do that. It feels just like an arbitrary challenge so they can say there's a challenge. If you've gone through the effort of adding in characters and programming them and creating sprites for them and movesets for them and all that shit, then just fucking let people play with them. That's, that's fair. My, that's my <laughs> yeah. hot take for the day. <laughs> Something I'm, I'm unsure on with the game is the price tag, though. When I saw it was twenty nine ninety nine, I was kind of taken aback. I mean, it's a good-looking game. It plays well. There's a lot of content. Good music, too. I, was, I quite like the music. Yeah, great music, great soundtrack, but I was expecting, like, 15 20 for this yeah i actually thought this was a 15 dollar game <laughs> i didn't check the price before i started like you know playing it but oh well yeah well as it stands at 30 dollars, what do you think of it at 30 dollars, i mean i'd be looking around for a physical version or something because like there's got to be something else to it um 100 levels is really cool um and like I said, yeah, the, the graphics look good. Music looks good. It's just like the gameplay is, you know, it's one of those things where you either just kind of idly play it until you're done with level 100 with like no trophies or you just like, you know, like trying to get the secret stuff in a Kirby game. It's just like you'll be frustratingly restarting stages like over and over and over and over just to try and get that last little bit. If that is if you are the latter person, if you're the person who plays a Kirby game or the 100%, 200% completion type stuff, and all the ridiculous things they make you do then. By the way, I've been streaming Kirby games lately, if you can't tell. <laughs> uh, then this is for you. Uh, if you are purchasing this for a young one who doesn't care about the trophies, uh, at least they don't seem to impede your progress, except for upgrading your character, which again, is just for this first character, which you're stuck with for 33 levels anyway, like, it's just boost stuff that, like, you're upgrading anyway. So it's like, you know, if you want to give this to a kid and then try the challenges yourself, then sure. But apart from that, yeah, I, I share with Joe's uh, hesitation on, like, the price tag in general. I'm just not really seeing, in this economy, a $30 game here. But that, you know, that just puts it at a try. It It's a good game. But at the price point, then, you know, try yeah, uh, I would recommend throwing it on your wish list. Uh, our site's usually pretty good at doing sales, so I'd imagine we would see some kind of discount on it eventually. But uh, it's worth checking out eventually. I think there's a demo on Steam, so give that a go. That could help yeah. convince you. Demos are always good. 
Uh, Chris, you got one more game to talk about that is called Star oh, yeah. Hunter DX, developed by 1CC Games, published by Chorus Worldwide Games, released August 5th on Switch and Steam for $14.99, betrayed by her cutthroat crew, Luna Star, former space pirate captain turned bounty hunter, has a score to settle. As Luna, travel to five exotic plants to track down your mutinous mates and face them in bullet hell dogfights to the death. Chris, tell us about your time with Star Hunter DX. All right, finally, a side-scrolling shmup for me to review. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. I can't believe it took this long to get to one shit. <laughs> I know, I can't believe it. Okay, but no, for real, this is this is great, and I'm going to try and talk about it quickly. <laughs> uh, Star Hunter DX, yes, this is a retro throwback style uh, bullet hell shoot 'em up uh, in the side scrolling variety, which is actually kind of interesting because you don't see bullet hells very often in the side scrollers. Yeah, they're usually, um, they're usually verticals. Little, you're, they're usually verticals, yeah. Um, but this one, yeah, is it actually will throw waves upon waves upon waves of, you know, uh, varying degrees of hard to dodge, like purple bullets at you. They're actually kind of pink in this one, but, you know, it's one of those colors you could argue about. Um, it has five stages, uh, six bosses, and here's the thing, though. Limited continues. <laughs> so, unlike Darius no. first with its free play <sighs> modes, uh, this one actually does give you a limit on continues and lives, and uh, no way to uh, turn that off. The In fact, the um, the option menu is a little sparse. It's got scan lines, music and sound volume, and then you can turn the cutscenes on or off. Uh, but you can also change the controls and stuff. But At least they have an option for scan lines. Yeah, the, you, you can absolutely turn the scan lines off. Because here's the thing, this game doesn't even look like any old game. It just looks like a new game with pixels. Like, there's no reason to have scan lines in here, but whatever. Uh, and in fact, like, that's a lot of the the aesthetic of this game is, like... We're not trying to make this look like an old game. Like we're just trying to make it look retro. Um, that I think is mostly uh, told by the soundtrack, because the soundtrack is entirely synthwave, which you know it's one of those things that I don't know. It has so many fans, and I don't understand why. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I was alive in the '80s. We didn't have this in the '80s. Um, you know. They, anyway, whatever. Um, the cool thing about it is that it's well okay the the main cool thing about it is that it is very very fun so don't you know I, this is not going to be a negative review that's you know spoiler alert uh but oh, what i do gasp. like <laughs> <laughs> what i do like about uh about it to kind of offset the limited lives and continues is that it has one of the most thorough practice modes i've ever seen so this is one of those games where it's like uh you know, they kind of want you to get good, but at least they give you the tools to do it. Um, you can start any of the stages that you've beaten so far, um, either doing the main stage or the boss, and you can shift your lives up to infinite at that point. Um, you can arm yourself with bombs and, you know, uh, also change bullet time and, like, the score multipliers and stuff, which we're about to talk about. And, you know, that kind of at least... And plus it has a how-to-play section, like that does a good job of like explaining the whole game to you like before you even start um so in that spirit this is how the game works as you uh so it's one of those kind of shmups that has what's called grazing uh which is slowly eating grass in a field if you didn't know (laughs) a lot of farm animals do it (laughs) okay i'm kidding that's a joke I'm uh I'm a little more lively on Mondays, I guess, because my soul hasn't been crushed so much. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh yeah, so it has grazing, which in shmup terms means that you get good stuff if you get if you let bullets get close to you without actually hitting you. Of course, the ship is not really the uh, the hitbox. The hitbox is a tiny dot inside the ship, so that's what you need to protect. Um, and then around the ship, there's a circle. And within that circle, and it's a pretty generous circle, actually, uh, within that circle, anything that flies by without killing you will uh, raise your your grazing points, essentially. And what that does is it raises um, 
like some combination of that and also destroying enemies uh raises your power level and it also well there's items to raise your power level sorry i misspoke uh it raises your bullet time which bullet time makes uh it makes bullets go away and it makes things move slightly slower so that you get more of an advantage if like enemies are sending too many waves after you there's also bombs that get refilled this way and you know your maximum capacity is three but the bombs are not like other bullet hells. They don't clear the entire screen. They clear a large area around your ship. So if you want to use a bomb to get rid of bullets, which is mainly what they're used for traditionally, then, you know, that's that's all you get to do with it. Or you can damage bosses with it or, you know, whatever. Your, the strategy's up to you. Um, and then, uh, what was I thinking here? Uh, so, yeah. The grazing basically raises your bullet time and that. And then, you know, power-ups, whatnot, make your ship more powerful. There's also a pretty stark difference between the characters, uh, which, again, you have to unlock through gameplay. Uh, However, you only have to get to level 3 to unlock your robot cat, and that's the only character you need, Cat 99. (laughs) Uh, Robot cat, I'm sold. Yeah, exactly. The other one's a dude with sunglasses who does like one of my least favorite ship configurations, which is high powered but no spread. Um, which yeah, I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> if you're a masochist, uh, <laughs> your main character has the spread shot, of course, and you know can do a, like uh, they can both do a straight ahead laser shot as well. Instead, if they, which you know traditionally in a bullet hell, it narrows your your shot, but it makes it more powerful. Um, and Cat99 has a really interesting one where uh, she, she, well, they, they use they pronouns. Um, like the regular shot without bullet time is a slowed down, like homing missile type of thing. And then when you uh, use your laser move, instead of slowing you down like it does the other characters, that's the one that lets you speed up. So your character is slow by default and then speeds up when they use their narrow shot, which is weird. <laughs> but it's a it's a great character, and I really appreciate that they put a cat bot in, in the game. So and I appreciate everything about this game. It's slick looking, uh the bullets are beautiful, the patterns are lovely, and the difficulty is absolutely there, and you will use up all those lives many times. Um, which, you know, in today's modern age, that's that's a little bit aberrant versus like, you know, the usual thing of letting you use rich kid strats to get through the game if you want. So that might be a hindrance to some people. Yeah. I want my rich kid strats. Yeah. (laughs) Well, 15 bucks on star hunter DX. What do you think? Yeah, this one's pretty much a gem. I say buy it. Um, I couldn't find much to complain about on it really apart from the limited lives, but I mean, that's, that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. Yeah. It's at least, like I said, they do offset it with some great um, options for like getting better at the game. And all in all, it's not the hardest schmuck to get through. So, you know, go for it. Cool beans. Yeah. All right. Well, Chris and Cole, that is it for the two of you. Woo-hoo. Hooray. Yay. Now back inside to the party. <laughs> I was just here to, to have hot takes about locked characters and continuity. Yeah. Even though you're not Did there you have, for the next review. Did yeah. you have a hot take about limited lives and super hard shmups? Yes. That's also bullshit. Just <laughs> let us continue. We're doing our best out here, people. There We're you trying. go. Hey, we already did 700 of these. What do you expect from us? <laughs> yeah. My hands hurt. And sometimes I just need to be able to press continue. All right. Well, any final words before I move on? Um... <laughs> I'm bad at the final words. Go play video games, kids. All right. And we got one final game to talk about tonight, and we are bringing in a good friend to check this one out. Glenn Case, how are you doing today, sir? I am well. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you for having me um, on here. And uh, how are you hanging in there? I'm I'm doing good. It's been a while since you've been on the show. You were on to chat about the Grammar Club a while back, a couple years. Oh, yeah. Wow, that has been a hot minute, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. It's been way too long. I think we did that one on Discord, so I finally got you to jump on Skype for this one. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. I, probably a little easier, but it works. It does. It does work. So are you excited to chat about a game? 
I am. I am so excited to chat about this. Um, you ended up asking um, if uh, if I had a PSVR, and it turns out that I do. And so, yeah, Winds and Leaves is the name I of will, this title. I will go into all the details. Uh, and yes, you did check this one out on PSVR because I sold mine when we got the PS5. <laughs> Helped fund it. But uh, fi yes, final game to talk about tonight is called Winds and Leaves, developed and published by Trebuchet Studio, released July 27th on PlayStation VR for $29.99. Stranded in a barren landscape, you are the only being capable of mastering the ancient art of growing vegetation. Journey across the steppe to discover landmarks left behind from a previous time. Uncover their secrets in order to unlock new equipment and gather ancient dormant seed varieties. Find the perfect conditions to plant them in and you'll witness magnificent trees grow to maturity and transform the landscape glenn tell us about winds and leaves well ye, they just said everything right there <laughs> honestly nice one of the things well to, to me like and this is going to sound completely wild and crazy but to me the game that this reminds me of the most is goes back a number of years mist if you go back to the original mist and here here's my reasoning for that in mist you have this weird landscape that you have been introduced to and not very much is explained about how you are supposed to interact with the environment and that is kind of the same sort of thing here where the tutorials that you have within winds and leaves are very very limited it'll be just little pop-ups that tell you how to move and outside of that you're pretty much on your own and you and part of learning about the landscape around you is trying to figure out how everything works mm. and, and why you're there and what you're doing um now granted like when i played mist as a teenager i didn't get very far i revisited that game as an adult and i finally did beat the game but it was only after breaking out pen and paper thankfully <laughs> the these puzzles within winds and leaves are not quite that difficult because that would be a real problem if you needed pen and paper and you're putting on a vr headset on and off that would that would be problematic I think. <laughs> that would but, suck so much that, it really really would um so uh in the first hour of gameplay i really struggled with the movement in the game and i think that's probably a problem that a lot of vr games have in general um, like in order to move forward, you press the two main buttons on your, um, and you have to use move controls. You cannot use like the, the regular PS4 controllers, not an option. So this is the two move controllers. You're using. Yes. Gotcha. You have to use that. And eventually it does become intuitive and second nature and you don't even have to think about it much, which I was pleased because within the first hour I was ready to throw things. I was cursing and I don't really do much of that usually, but this, this game had me incredibly frustrated at first, <laughs> but it eventually like, okay, it, it's, you know, it started making more sense, but you press the two main things and you move like an up and down movement, basically, um, with your hands, like it's up and down, like back and forth, basically. And that's your legs. That's how you move forward. I didn't realize how to move backwards, though. I'm like, how do I move backwards? I don't understand. And the answer is to put the move controllers behind your back basically like uh, above your shoulders and do the same thing and then you move backwards but yeah. it's not but it's not like the on-screen instructions told me that i had to figure that out as it went yeah. to me the the toughest part was turning like you can move and strafe kind of left and right by tilting the controls one way it's like okay that makes sense now but trying to turn where something uh, by by default there's a button that you press that moves you 45 degrees one direction. The problem is if I'm looking forward and then 45 degrees one direction is over here and I want to be able to go someplace between the two of those, we have a problem. Yeah, if you need like 23 and a half degrees. Exactly. So I will say for people who are playing this, if it doesn't make you seasick doing so, there are other options within the controls where you can um, – what I the the version of it that I liked, you look to the left or the right, and then you press the button, and now that's in front of you. That actually felt a little more like this is this is how it should be, probably like their their primary thing. But um, and, and it's interesting when you're playing a game before it officially comes out, and there's clearly some bugs. Um, yeah, the, that happens. The joys of pre-release gameplay. 
<laughs> in this welcome, case, Glenn. Welcome to that world. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was it was amusing in in one way. One thing I'm quite sure they've patched this out since then. But there was a menu that says wins and leaves. Press any button. So I'm pressing several buttons after I had restarted the game and that menu was not going anywhere. It was now part of my life. <laughs> and it was now that for the rest of the game I was going to have this menu. But they've patched that out. They've put out at least two patches already. What That's they have good. not patched what they've not patched out, and I can confirm this because even in my most recent gameplay, there's a danger of losing all of your gameplay and having to restart if you get stuck on a rock. And this can end up happening because you are planting trees in some cases. You climb that tree, and I would fall onto a rock. You're not supposed to be able to fall, but you like drop down to a rock. Well, the problem is now I'm not close enough to the tree to be able to get back in the tree and climb it. I can't walk off of the rock. There's no jump button. I'm stuck on top of this rock. And Oh, no. And so, like, how do I restart? Well, I thought, oh, I'll go to the main menu. I'll just go to the main menu, and then I'll, like, come back into the game. You come back into the game, you're still on top of that same rock. That part has not been patched out. Um, I had two very close calls where I almost lost all of my progress. Because in one case, I got to an area I should not have been able to have gotten to. Thankfully, what happened in that case is I was able to die. If you're too, the whole point of this game, the way that it's set up, is trees protect you. If you are within the vicinity of a tree, you are safe. If you are in a desert area where there is no trees, the further that you go away from trees, there is something that will essentially kill you. You'll run out of power and then you'll go back to your most recent safe thing. So thankfully, in the, the area where I went outside of the game boundary where I was supposed to be, Thankfully, I was able to die, and it brought me back where I needed to go, and then I didn't have to restart. That was that was a relief. That's good. Yes. The second time that it ended up happening in my most recent gameplay, I thought, ooh, I think this puzzle might be, um, be a situation where I want to grow a tree, climb that tree, and then go over to the rocks over here. Turned out I was wrong, and this was the same situation where, once again, I'm on top of a rock. I cannot climb the tree because it is not close enough to me. And it occurred to me, if I can grow a tree that is close to me, maybe I'll be able to climb it and get out of that. And I would, once again, crisis averted. But what I think they desperately need to add to this game is some sort of a die slash give up button that will take you back to your most recent basic save point. Yeah, or like a help feature, like an MMOs, how if you get stuck in the geometry, you just hit that and it teleports you back to a safe spot. Bingo. It desperately needs that because um, it like I I think they've done amazing with the art direction. They've created a world that I am curious about. I want to know more about it. I want to explore every bit of the map. I want to understand what's going on. Again, it's beautiful. The music and the sound effects are great, but there is that inherent risk that the thing that I am thinking of is as the solution is not the solution. I'm going to get trapped somewhere, and then I'm going to lose all of my progress and have to restart over, which is um, not that that should not be how it works. No. Yeah. But in but in every other respect, I think that they've got a, a very unique, interesting VR experience that if there is a person who is interested in VR, um we get closer to the buy it category. It I right. I'm, I'm I'm fluctuating between try it and buy it. Gotcha. And it, and it's based more on things that I think that they probably can patch out. If they patch out this rock thing, I think we go from a try it to a buy it, but I'm solidly closer to the try it. Um, thing because it's not going to be for everyone. Um, did, did I skip ahead by no. by talking about try it or buy? No, that's fine. <laughs> that makes my job easier. I don't have to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's a wonderful game, um, and I do think that it becomes frighteningly without you don't you don't have to think about what you're doing after a while. Yeah, like it becomes second nature that I grab this tool. Well, and, and I was, tr it's funny, their description told more than I wanted to tell because I wanted to, because <laughs> I, I feel like part of the experience of this really is learning how all of the tools work and how you function within, in this world. But like everything that I was afraid to say, they say in the description as that it is but, right off the PlayStation store stuff. So. Yeah, exactly. That's, they, on, they, that's on you, Trebuchet. <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, no, I I think it's I think it's a very creative and interesting game that is at the very least worth trying. Um, and for a certain subset of the audience who likes um, VR experiences, this is this is a great VR game. Cool. So twenty nine ninety nine. Your official verdict. You know, um, I'm going to go ahead and and say buy it. Because I do think that it is it, it it it's right there between that try it and buy it. But my complaints about it are more just like things that m- they might very well patch out. And they've um, been oh, active. You said that they've already put out patches, so they're active in development. Two. They're keeping an eye on this. Yes, I I think this is clearly a title that was made with a lot of love and care. Um, and it is a unique experience that, again, the closest one I could personally think of that was anything like it was missed because it really is like this. There's nothing after you that's trying to actively kill you, even when you're dying in the desert. It's not like you have a being that is coming up to you and stalking you and trying to kill you. It's more like you're too far away from the trees. And as a result of this, you're going to die if you don't act. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a good time. So, yeah, it's. I think so. Glenn, thank you for checking out this game and coming on the show. Uh, that is it for this episode. Made it through another one. Uh, thanks to the party cast crew for coming on, doing their reviews. Thanks to Chris for making time to come on and do his, even though he had a show. Uh, big thanks to Dan Airy at Rainbite for coming on, chatting about Trigger Witch. That game is out now. Check it out. It is awesome. Uh, Going to play some music from, from Trigger Witch to end the show. Glenn, do you have any final words to wrap it up? Um. Stay funky, fellas. 